Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the third meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015? Can I remind everybody present to ensure that all electronic devices, particularly phones, are switched off? Um, they obviously do interfere with the sound system and obviously they're also an interruption if they do um, ring. Uh, can I move on to item one on the agenda this morning uh, on Curriculum for Excellence? The, uh, this parliamentary session, the Education and Culture Committee, has held a number of meetings uh, on CFE and the progress that hopefully is being made. Uh, one of the most significant changes to Scottish education, I think we'd all agree, in recent years, um, and it's important certainly to not only to this committee and the Parliament, but also parents, pupils and I'm sure teachers, to ensure that we're making uh, satisfactory progress. Um, can I also just at this stage thank those members of the public who responded to the uh, online request for questions and submissions? We've had some, and I'm sure members may pick up one or two of those as we go along. Um, today's meeting is specifically to look at the implementation of the new higher qualifications, um, but obviously we're also like to discuss some of the other topical CFE issues um, as we go along. Can I welcome this morning Graham Logan from Education Scotland, Larry Flanagan from the EIS, uh, Jane Peckham from the National Association of Schoolmasters Union of Women Teachers, uh, Dr Janet Brown from the SQA, and Robert McMillan from the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association. Welcome to all of you this morning. Obviously, it's like a large panel. I will reiterate that um, not everybody has to answer every question. Um, I do try. You don't always respond that well to that particular comment, but hopefully, if somebody's covered it, then I would, I would appreciate if you don't have to, then please don't. Um, however, if you've got something to add, then by all means, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll get you in. Um, members, I know, have a number of questions this morning, but I'm going to start off with Mary Scanlon. Mary. Um, we have a significant amount of uh, evidence uh, here today, and um, I, I, I couldn't help reading the one from Mary Erskine. This curriculum is far from excellent. Uh, I think Jean Brodie couldn't have put it better herself. Um, so we've still got the problems running through, bogged down with bureaucracy and assessment, teachers being stressed, and you know a bit of a patchwork solution. But I think, to be fair, we are where we are, and we have to look forward. It's certainly what I would want to do on behalf of pupils. So looking forward, my main concern would be the articulation between... Uh, the new hire and the advanced hire, or I should really say the articulation between the old hire and the new advanced hire, because although 45% of pupils this year are doing the old hire, if you look at the STEM subjects, and we took evidence on that last week, biology, physics and chemistry, uh, those doing the new hire, 40%, 39 and 38. And my concern is... Does doing the old hire put pupils at a disadvantage that they've suddenly got to jump in to the new hire, because the new advanced hire? Because uh, I understand that there's not going to be any postponement or any choice next year. My understanding is everyone must do the advanced hire. But throughout the papers we've got today, from head teachers, principal teachers, and others. There is an underlying concern about pupils having done the old hire this year and having to jump next year at such a critical time of their learning. So I'm looking for an assurance about what you're doing there. We respond to the you know what's happening and where we are with it, and then I'll come to Larry. Sure, thanks very much. Morning, everyone. Um, I think firstly to say that. Um, there's been extensive engagement with teachers to create support materials around the new higher, uh, advanced higher courses, and those will all be published online in March. And there is subject-specific support in all areas as well um, to, to support that. So the sciences, um, which Ms Scanlon mentioned in particular, have had uh, an enhanced package of support. So the, the, the online service there in GLOW for sciences has been our, our, our most popular. Teachers sharing their materials. There's um, collaborative writing networks where teachers are getting together um, to write materials and to, to support one another. And our subject specialists have been looking at the content of both the existing and the new hire and the articulation to the advanced hire um, to see uh, how the content compares, how the learner progression um, also articulates, and then providing further guidance to schools there as well. So there, there will be no um, disadvantage for children um, who, sit, who are sitting hires this year, because remember the quality of a hire, the standard of 
of the hire is a hire, uh, whether it's the existing or, or new. And in fact, teachers have made a local professional decision as to which course to pursue. And that's very much in line with the spirit of Curriculum for Excellence. And we also know that our teachers are very skilled at planning progression and are looking very closely at the content of courses. And in the case of sciences, I think everyone recognised that the content did need to be updated uh, quite significantly, and, and that has happened. And there is, as I say, a, a huge amount of additional support in that area to, to support teachers um, to, to, to make that, that change. And of course, the whole nature of advanced hire is very different. Um, it's pre-university learning. At that level, young people are, are, are studying um, largely independently. Um, there's a lot more investigative skills, all the sort of skills they've been developing through Curriculum for Excellence, um, they'll be able to use and, and apply at that level. And remember, the numbers of young people are much smaller uh, numbers doing that, and the schools work together through local consortias and so on to, to deliver advanced hires. Um, so a big emphasis and focus, I think, from the SQA and ourselves um, to support the transition from hire to advanced hire, whether it's the existing course or, or the new course heard about the help and support before yep. but if I just read out a short statement from the chair of Madras College St Andrews parent council uh, we've been given to understand that in many subjects the old hires do not articulate well with the new advanced hire so I think it's just a little bit more I mean will those that have done the old hire be at a disadvantage doing the new advanced hire that's the that runs through the briefing papers that we've got today. We can't turn the clock back, but we could surely learn lessons to help and support. These schools are worried about it, so I think we should be worried too. Can I have a direct comment on that? Graham, before we move on. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why there's a huge amount of additional support going in to look at the progression from existing or new hire to advanced hire, that's where all the energy and all the support's going, to look at how the content progresses and compares. And that's why we're producing materials that teachers are writing themselves and we're supporting that. So that is where there's a really clear focus to make sure that young people aren't disadvantaged, um, to look at the lines of progression, subject-specific lines, to provide additional support. And we know, as I say, that teachers are very skilled um, in doing that, but all available support is going to, to look at the articulation. You would acknowledge that they are worried as of today. Hopefully this will come forward, but as of today, the evidence we have today, that they are worried. There's obviously you know, a, a, a small number there of, of schools have responded um, and they are anxious and they're anxious they're because anxious. teachers want to do their best um, this time last year as well that we were in a similar situation with the introduction of the, the new nationals and um, we, we're in the middle of a series of head teacher events. We've seen in the last week about 600 secondary heads and deputies and we'll see the remaining over the next two weeks. We'll have seen every secondary head teacher in Scotland to look at the support that's available to look at these issues and in fact we've got head teachers showcasing and sharing the ways that they're going around um, planning for progression and remember that's an area that teachers in Scotland are very skilled at doing planning progression from one qualification to the next or through curriculum for excellence levels. You will ensure that those who did the old hire yeah. rather than have a conversation between the two of you I want to yeah. bring in some of the other members of the panel and I'll come back to you Mary. Uh, Larry and then Janet. Um, thanks Gavina. Um uh, Jean Brodie was quite a reactionary educational thinker, uh, just as a, as a passing comment. Um, I think in relation to this year, one of the, the points that we'd be keen to stress is that the decision by the Cabinet Secretary, the previous Cabinet Secretary, to allow schools to choose between the uh, revised uh, the, the old hire and the, the new CFE hire um, has actually been crucial to ensuring that um, we have a, a relatively stable situation in schools. Um, but we immediately, once that decision was made, we immediately raised our concern that there therefore should logically, there should be the same ability to defer between the existing advanced hire and the new uh, advanced hire, um, partly because of the issues of articulation, although there would be a debate around how well all the current advanced hires articulate with hire, because they, they are a different uh, type of qualification. But the big issue for us, I think, um, is that there is a workload issue around developing a new course. And 
if 45% of schools have deferred, or 45% of uh, departments have deferred on the current hire, that means that next year they will be delivering for the first time the new CFE hire. And the idea that alongside that they also have to deliver the new advanced hire, to me, just creates an additional workload uh, problem uh, and a capacity issue. Because there are a number of reasons why schools have deferred in terms of the CFE hire this year. Um, some of it's to do with uh, content change, but a lot of it's to do with workload. Because a lot of schools this year are actually concentrating on learning the lessons of National 4 and National 5 last year, which I think the last time we were here we, we recognised uh, had been a, 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 a challenging uh, agenda uh, and a, a number of revisions in terms of how, how options were presented to pupils and so forth had to be looked at. So the workload concerns that we had raised last year around National 4 and National 5, which I think were generally acknowledged, haven't particularly abated this year um, around... Uh, the hire, because even where people are delivering the old hire, they are reviewing the broad general education S1 to S3 and its articulation with National 4, National 5, they're reviewing National 4, National 5. Um, SQA have helpfully uh, streamlined the uh, verification process, but there's still a lot of concern that there is over-assessment uh, around National 4, National 5, just in terms of the, the, the unit assessments. So there is no evidence coming to us from our members that the workload pressures of last year have abated in any real sense. And it's in that context, I think, that we, we are concerned that the option around uh, having deferring the, the new advanced hire for a further year to articulate with any decisions that were made this year is not being presented. Now, we do recognise that that represents a challenge for SQA because... Uh, you know, they've planned to, to turn off the, the tap in relation to the old advanced hire this year. Um, but I think the consequence will be, if there is no option around that, that because of these workload pressures, because of the staffing pressures that are on in, in terms of uh, school timetables, uh, a lot of schools will just drop the advanced hire. It's already under huge pressure. Just in time, I mean, to, to run an advanced hire class... You're, you're normally looking for between 10 and 20 pupils for a viable class. So advanced hire has already been dropped in a whole range of subject areas. In Glasgow, kids have to go to university on a Wednesday afternoon to set some advanced hires because they, they can't get viable classes in the schools. So the danger here um, is not that people will push ahead with the advanced hire uh, and take on board the workload pressure. I think the danger is that they'll turn away from it um, and advanced hire will, will be marginalised in terms of uh, being on offer in our secondary schools. I've got a number of members, who are, I'm presuming by their uh, way, they've got specific supplementaries on what has just been said. Before I, well, I'll, come back, I'll come back to Mary in a second. I'll bring in very quickly supplementaries. Check. Good morning. Um, I wonder, just on, on the basis of what we heard, because this is a major step change, as we all know, in education. I wonder if uh, Dr Brown, we have a quote from you saying the first year is always difficult, the second year will be better. Isn't it the case of the programme, in your experience, that that's exactly uh, where we're at, that the first year is difficult, the second year will be better, and better still? Um, I think what we're, what we're seeing and, and what Larry and, and Graham have articulated is in terms of the first year of any qualification, there is always an understanding uh, developed during the course of actually running that qualification and understanding how it operates. Um, and I think that that lesson has been learned during the course of this year. And I think people, are, if you talk to teachers, the, the, the temperature seems to be a lot um cooler than it was. I'm not saying it's cold. I'm not saying that there aren't challenges, but I'm saying I think there is there is a, a more of an understanding of what the nature of the change is, and the, the questions are much more concise, and we're able to address some of them through some of the support that's being undertaken either by us or by other bodies. Um, so, so I think I, I would stand by that statement that says the very first year is always difficult of any change, I think, in anything. 
And I think understanding and seeing and going through the process makes people able to articulate their questions in a better way, apes, a, a, enables people to be able to respond to those questions and, and um, put in place changes, such as the change to verification that we undertook as a result of uh, really looking at what do we still need to do to maintain standards, but what, do we, what have we learnt from the first round that actually enables us to take a different sampling regime and has changed the approach that we're undertaking this year, where we are actually, in this first first round, we're not doing verification. We are actually doing training, which will allow those teachers to go back into the system to train others. And we're using uh, candidate exemplification, candidate material to be able to do that training. So we've learned. We've learned. The teachers have learned. Other people have learned. And I think this year is... is um, more manageable, I think. I think the work pressure is still a challenge, uh, but I think people know what they're doing, uh, including us. I wonder then, by me, uh, Graham Logan, uh, given that set of circumstances, in, in your report we talked about uh, the range of activities, including challenging over-bureaucratic approaches uh, found <coughs> during inspection, and local authorities uh, are, are taking forward actions <coughs> in, in the working group's report on tackling bureaucracy. Uh, I mean, can you perhaps give an example uh, of a particular, I mean, I've got your report here and, and want to ask you about the outcomes on that in a minute. But, uh, I mean, again, in any new and a major programme like this, that one could say, well, you know, all of the bureaucratic wrinkles <laughs> should have been taken out at the beginning. It never works that way in any major project. Um, I mean, how is that progressing? And you know, can you give an example of? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing significant progress um, with, with tackling bureaucracy. As you say, initially, teachers want to do their best so that, you know, they're, they're, they're looking in depth at approaches to planning and, and assessing. But the, the report was very clear that we need to challenge that to prioritise time for, for teaching and learning. So, you know, some of the IT systems, for example, we've been looking at and we've been supporting schools to, to streamline those and clarify and simplify uh, what they've been doing in inspections. And we had a primary school recently um, in Dundee, for example, where there was a main point for action to reduce the amount of time teachers are spending with planning and assessment systems so that they can focus on learning and teaching. Each local authority in Scotland has given a response about how they are taking forward the recommendations of the report, and we're monitoring that through our team of area lead officers. And we're also um, really helping to, to simplify and clarify what teachers um, need to do. So route maps through assessment, for example, give teachers a sequence list of the key documents they need to consult in order to uh, plan and assess young people's progress. And, and they've been um, used extensively across Scotland. We've got a new key curriculum support website, which again just highlights the, 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 the key um, support and advice for teachers um, when, when they have time for, for planning and assessment. And I think finally we've recently published um, significant aspects of learning in each curriculum area, which in one side of A4 summarise the key steps um, for, of progression in, in each curriculum area. So there's still work to do, I think, um, to, to challenge unnecessary bureaucracy, but we've seen significant progress and we continue um, to, to work together to make sure that that, that does improve. I'm sorry. It was supposed to be a supplementary, Mr. Brody. <laughs> let's let's can let me bring in uh, Robert and Jane at this stage. They've been waiting to come in, so Robert. Right. It's just a quick point um, in terms of uh, to echo um, some of the things that Larry was saying, and uh, also to some extent what Janet said. Um, there can be all sorts of material published to support teachers, but the challenge that they face, as well as spinning all the plates they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, is first of all accessing that information, making sense of it, and and having an impact in terms of their practice and what they do. I mean, I had a look last night at Education Scotland's website, and just in terms of one, one page, in terms of learning, teaching and assessment, there's about 20 different links to things that you could be looking at in terms of just improving your practice. If we look as a subject specialist in terms of the SQA's resources and support, it's a similar picture. People don't have the time to assimilate all of these things. That's partly why there's a fear in terms of the change and why people are hesitant in moving forward. Also in terms of some of the changes that have taken place, teachers traditionally would have time during the study leave period uh, after Easter when many of their senior pupils would be away undertaking exams and that traditionally would be a time where people would be able to come together to plan what they were doing, to undertake some of the work that they were doing, but that time has been taken away because of 
huge cohort in some schools in terms of national four candidates don't have external exams and so schools are making arrangements or authorities are making arrangements to, to work with those pupils and other things. And again, those pupils have to be uh, taught, those pupils have to be looked after and so the time that teachers would ordinarily have to come together is being taken away from there. So yes, there's a pressure in terms of workload but that is made worse um, and much more of a greater pressure because people are having to do so much. SQA and ourselves you know, share a concern over those subjects whereby traditionally and currently they're being taught by very small departments or single teacher delivery. And the pressure on those teachers is huge at a time when local authorities have taken away advisors, have taken away um, subject support centrally. And so many of the pressures that perhaps could be relieved um, are actually being taken away and are becoming much more of a constraint on people. Um, and how we work through that is actually going to be very challenging uh, over the period ahead. Want to come in? Thanks, yes, it was just um, a point in terms of the tackling bureaucracy uh, issues. I mean, a, a huge amount of, of work has gone into reviewing how the first year went to reducing all the bureaucracy and needless uh, work that's been done. And I mean, we've been in full support of that, but it's still not translating to the classroom at the moment. And the concern that we have is it's taking a long time to translate the recommendations from these two working groups down to the classroom. Um, and we're currently doing um, some research into just how quickly the local authority responses are actually being uh, understood and recognised at school level because the evidence we have from members at the moment is that it's not in fact impacting positively in the way that it should be. I know that the C3 Management Board are, are looking again at this and how the message can be strengthened, but I think it would be wrong to just tick that box and say, well, we've dealt with bureaucracy, let's move on. Thank you. Um, Mary, you, you start to kick us off and come back to you. Just a, my final question, convener. It was just to say that uh, we don't, we're not, not taking evidence today from parents, uh, so I think it's only fair to read out a comment from the National Parent Forum for Scotland, and it would relate to it's about the SQA website. It may well be that there are plans to update the information, but it is unfortunate that there's nothing currently available, as many parents will be looking for this now as prelims are underway in many schools and parents will, looking, will be looking for this information now to support their children to revise in April. So despite all your warm words, parents out there are looking for some information, some guidance, some advice. Every parent wants to do the best for their children. Nothing available. Can I just add on my final question so that you could answer it at the same time. And the final question is really, I, I've no doubt that you watched the, or heard the evidence session last week from the Learned Societies about the STEM uh, lack of teachers, the reduction in teachers. I, I don't need to go over all the information, but Colin Beattie and I were in Inverness yesterday with the Public Audit Committee, and we were taking evidence about the shortage of doctors in the afternoon convener. But one of the problems was that uh, the lack of qualifications to get into Scottish medical schools. So there is a further implication of this, and particularly in remote and rural areas. So, A, is there such a shortage of teachers in the science and uh, computing and math subjects? We've got a comment here. I know a lot of teachers chucking in the towel, and CFE is the reason. Is there a shortage of teachers? I saw you last night on uh, Newsnight, Larry. I think you said that Murray is the tip of the iceberg. In my lifetime, I've never heard of schools having to close and send pupils home due to a lack of teachers. I'm seriously concerned about that, but also about the, the STEM subjects in particular. If it's a problem in Murray, goodness knows what it's like in North West Sutherland and some of the islands. So looking forward, um, just if you could answer that question, and also on the SQA website, because despite what you're saying, parents are desperately looking for support. And according to the briefing we've got, it's not there. Okay, thank you. Uh, can do the yeah, um, I think the, the, the particular point that you were raising from the uh, parents' uh, submission was around um, the, the exam practice, the, the practice papers. 
Uh, I think in any new qualification, unfortunately, there are no past papers because no, no papers have been produced in the, in, in, uh, over time. What we have done in terms of hires, for instance, this year is added as a result of all the feedback that we've got, added an, an additional exemplar hire paper for every subject. And as part of that exemplification, it's also, um, it, it, it helps teachers to be able to build their own uh, question papers using past questions from previous. They don't mention papers. Paragraph 2.4. They do not mention that they want a list of past papers. They are asking for clear, easily accessible information. They're just asking for information. Okay. Uh, let me to just clarify fair. then. Uh, sorry, I, I, I had obviously okay. misremembered that. Um, but just to, just to finish that point, we, 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 uh, are, we have published previous questions from previous papers that fit in the new curriculum for excellence qualifications so that enables teachers to have a broader set of of, of work to undertake which then can also be used by parents and by by candidates themselves as, as examination practice. In terms of the communication to parents in general, there's been a very, very strong uh, collaboration with the National Parent Forum. We, we meet with them on a regular basis. We, we talk through with them. We provide specific information either through ourselves or through Education Scotland uh, for parents on what the new qualifications mean, what uh, the changes as a result of Curriculum for Excellence have resulted in. And that communication has gone out either through the website or through, through leaflets to individual, um, to, through the schools to parents. Or I think last year I actually sent out uh, a flyer to every single student who is undertaking qualifications last year. So we are trying as much as we can to make sure that parents are fully aware of the changes. Not only parents as well, but also employers who are looking to, to see these students come out of the schools and need to understand what the qualifications mean to them. You wanted to go on on this? Uh, <clears throat> as briefly as I can, uh, convener, um, just very quickly, firstly, though, Graham said that attacking bureaucracy, we were making significant progress. I'm sorry, I have to disagree with Graham. The Tackling Bureaucracy Working Group met in this building last week and its conclusion uh, was that whilst the key messages in the report are, are, are the correct messages, the progress has been patchy at best. Um, and in fact, the, the group is looking to relaunch the, the key messages in order to try and make the significant progress that, that, uh, that Graham uh, is alluding to. Um, in relation to... Uh, to, to Mary's points, I, I think the, um, the, although the question wasn't directly around practice papers, uh, one of the concerns which I think the National Parent Forum have expressed is the fact that as parents they are looking for practical ways to support their children preparing for the exams. Um, and I think they do reference the fact that there's a, an absence of practice papers. Now, I, I don't accept Janet's uh, proposal that you can't have uh, practice papers until after the the exams, because the you know in a different time frame you would pilot the the, the exams and you would produce uh, exemplification for schools. If you look at on page thirty three of your your documents, the bottom paragraph, SQA is saying that next year they'll provide full exemplification for for the new hire and we'll do the same the following year for advanced hire. That that's a year too late. That's a, a year after the exams have actually been implemented. Um, and the last time we were all here, um, we did press for SQA to produce at least four uh, uh, practice papers in each subject area. I know they have a uh, 100% increase on the National 4, National 5, and that there are two rather than one uh, this year. And there have been some useful additional questions produced. But when I was back at my old school last week, and I took the chance to speak to some higher pupils. And... They were, they were actually they were remarkably sanguine about the, you know the, the 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 whole process, but the key point that they made was they feel that they lack a uh, practice in exam technique, because although there are questions from past papers they can use as as coursework, um, their prelims came as a shock to them, having to do an exam paper in a timed circumstance, and the difficulty is there there are, there is limited resource there in terms of. SQA have got two practice papers uh, on their on their on their uh, on the website. Um, so if you use one as a practice and one as your prelim, you've used up your resource. One of the things which I think Scottish government could helpfully do here 
is provide some additional funding to schools in terms of their per capita budgets. In the run-up to National 4 and National 5, uh, Mike Russell released a million pound to schools per capita budgets in order to allow schools to buy textbooks for uh, pupils who are moving into National 4 and National 5. When we were here last, we talked about the fact that a lot of the commercial products had been put on hold uh, to allow for the final changes to be made to the hires. Most of that material is now available. Most of it became available in the autumn. But schools, for a school, uh, any department in a school to buy a full set of textbooks would use up almost its entire per capita. So if, if you're looking for a practical step that would actually help young people who are sitting, the new hires, I would suggest that Scottish Government could fund at least one textbook uh, for all of these pupils so that they can uh, they can build towards. And it's, it's replicating what was done last time in National 4, National 5. Um, on, on the final point, uh, convener, uh, around the STEM su uh, subjects, I did uh, read with interest the comments I made last week. Um, I don't think the comments around, uh, you know, science, the science subjects and maths, uh, had as much purchase in Scottish terms as they do in UK terms. I mean, I think a lot of that research was largely based upon England. Um, but I do think, you know, I do think there is an issue, um, and the Murray scenario does highlight it, that teaching is becoming a less attractive uh, uh, job option for a lot of graduates uh, who are aware that you know wages have slipped, that workload is there, that stress levels are high. Um, in, in our survey last year, only one in two of our members said they would recommend teaching as a profession. Now, if you have teachers not advocating teaching as a worthwhile profession, then I think that reflects the, the amount of pressure that there is in the system. Uh, and certainly we, we are keen for Scottish Government to conclude a, a, an agreement with COSA around protecting teacher numbers, um, because that, that at least gives out a message that this is a priority for, for government and for, for Scottish government and for local government. Can I, I mean, there's a lot of members and I'm sure panel members also want to come in here. I'm going to come to Janet, but just if I remember rightly, you were on Scotland 2015 last, last night, uh, Larry, and, and I heard you say, make those comments, the same ones you've just made just now. Are there any vacancies? Um, are we short of applicants for uh, teacher training at the moment? I mean, are, are, there, are we, have we got a teacher training course that's got fewer people in it than we have places available? No, and I think one of the things that Scottish Government has, has, done, has use, usefully done is that uh, through the Teacher Workforce Planning Group, the uh, number of student probationer places in the North East and Aberdeen has been increased in the hope that um, it will attract more local applicants. It's not, it's not an absolute, but in the hope that it will attract more local applicants who might be more inclined to stay in the North East and address some of the shortages. Um, the, the, so, the, and there's no shortage of applications to teacher training. So the that's my question. Because, the, sorry, the, dif sorry. the difficulty, though, is that there is no tracking system for where those teachers go after they've, they've finished their probation year. And there's clear evidence, if you, if you look at the, the numbers, that we are training people who are then not going into the profession. And, and that's, that's where we've raised with Scottish Government the need to actually track where... I mean, some young people head off to teach abroad, you know, as, as, as part of, you know, their, their, their life plan. Um, a number head down to England. But we are, we are training teachers, but not actually seeing them materialise in the system. So, th so there is an issue there. It's not around the numbers who are applying to college or being, or being enrolled in college. It's actually translating that group into teachers in our classrooms, because there's definitely... Uh, slippage there, uh, quite so significant. The point is, though, it's clearly still attractive for young people to apply to go through teacher training. Now, young people have always gone abroad or down south, and I know teachers who have come from down south or abroad to teach here. So that, that has been, as always, the case. Now, there may be particular issues I accept around the, the current situation with workload, but I, I am concerned that we're given perhaps unintentionally an impression that there's, there's no demand for teacher training. That, that, that's not true, is it? Well, I think there is a demand for teacher training. I think young people are still looking at it. Um, the, the, the bigger issue, I think, is translating that training into 
teachers working in our school. Okay, I get the point. Now, a number of the panel members, Janet, I know you wanted to come in, and Graham, and Robert, and, and possibly Jane, but <laughs> let Janet. I, I think just on the, um, the support for um, STEM subjects in general, I think that that is one area that um, we recognise that we play a significant part in, and we, we are very involved in putting on CPD for science because of the significant changes that have occurred, because the curriculum moves so much faster in science. I mean, uh, what I learned as a physics graduate is, is not what people are learning as physics graduates now. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other area uh, that, you, that teachers get really strong support from are the learner societies. Um, the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh has done a lot of work in terms of chemistry, in terms of computing, and the F Institute of Physics is very, very heavily involved in supporting physics teachers in Scotland. <laughs> and I think the plan and C activity that's been funded through Scottish Government for developing uh, computing teachers uh, is, is very, very positive. Again, it's about making sure that that touches every teacher because there has been a significant and should be a significant change in the nature of the science learning that's going on in schools because of the fast-moving pace that happens in those subjects. Graham. Yeah, thank you. Convener, just to go back to Ms Scanlon's point about parents, just wanted to draw your attention on page 78 to the survey results that from Education Scotland questionnaires, which are a national sample of schools across the full country, and that parental satisfaction with education, you can see 91% agree or strongly agree that they're happy with the school, 77% agree or strongly agree the school keeps them well informed about children's progress. So we've seen... We've seen, we've seen um, very high and positive trends there. And just to go back to the National Parent Forum for Scotland, we work really closely with them, as Janet was saying. For example, we've collaborated to produce nutshells, so nationals in a nutshell, higher in a nutshell, which is really clear, simple advice about the content of courses and where young people and parents can seek revision material. And again, um, that's been very positively received and very, very well used. I think also we need to keep encouraging schools and, and local authorities um, to communicate with parents as much as possible because, of course, a parent, parents get most of their information from talking with their own teachers. But certainly there's an extensive programme there um, to, to communicate and to support parents um, with, with revision. And also, as I say, in the, the STEM subjects, it's a, a major priority for us in terms of training and support. Um, the, the primary sector, for example, we're working with, with CERC on, on mentoring. So we've got 240 primary mentors trained. There's uh, extensive support. Um, Janet mentioned work with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. For example, Jeremy Scott helped to, to write the National Four and Five Computing Science um, uh, materials. So there is extensive collaboration across the system and obviously there's more work to continue to do. <coughs> if I can. Uh, firstly, in terms of the production of additional specimen question papers, whilst a lot of teachers have welcomed that, Colleagues, for example, in RMPS have been concerned that the second new specimen question paper changed the goalpost in terms of what looked likely to be in the exam. And as a result of that, the RMPS uh, teachers have come together and have written formally to SQA about their concerns on that. Secondly, in terms of the support, I was looking at a publisher's information yesterday for a range of subjects. Some of the support materials that I think are the sorts of things that parents would be looking to purchase to support their, their um, children are either unpublished just now or for the current uh, hire, are being published next month or April or in May, just at the same time as pupils are actually undertaking the examinations themselves. In terms of some of the wider issues, um, colleagues in my uh, union um, have concerned in the North East about um, pupils undertaking um, higher courses where they ha actually haven't had a, a science specialist teacher. And the only way the school and the teachers can work around that is through study support. Um, pupils are coming into school on a Saturday um, and they're seeking to get colleagues in from other schools because they simply do not have a subject specialist in one of the science subjects. Um, and there's also the wider issue in terms of attracting people to the North East. Um, one of my um, co former colleagues who was a probationer with me and um, got a full-time permanent post in Aberdeen. She's looking to move south because she simply cannot afford to stay there um, and is looking you know, to try and get a job in the central belt because of the, um, the cost of living there. And I think that the, uh, all of these sorts of things all of these pressures that we've spoken about are the sorts of things that have an impact on whether someone's considering having a career in teaching. Because, yes, there are so many benefits, there are so many wonderful opportunities that we have as teachers. Um, maybe I'm alone in that because I'm the only teacher here. Um, but the, the constraints that people are facing just now make that a, you know, an extreme barrier. Actually, 
colleagues it's been covered. have covered it. Thank you very much, Jean. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I want to move on. We've got a number of members who want to come in. I'm going to start with Colin. Members of the panel this morning have uh, spoken about teachers' workload, and indeed some of the submissions we've got here refer to that. And I recall in previous sessions we've had that's also come up for discussion. Has anyone ever tried to quantify by way of br a breakdown of exactly what's contributing to that workload? We've yeah. heard bits here and bits there, but I, I'm a layman. I, you know, you can't expect me to fully understand what uh, what a teacher does in, in respect to this, what additional work they might be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there some sort of breakdown? Is there a way we can understand the different elements that come together to add to that workload? Yes, okay. Um, well, in terms of a breakdown, what we, what we asked members to do was to actually record everything that they did in terms of uh, their working hours, their additional... Uh, things they did, their preparation, and a lot of the bureaucratic stuff that we've talked about before, um, the data collection, the, the numerous reports that need filled out and recording and so on, and we've covered that in the previous sessions. I mean, teachers' role is to, is to teach, and I think that you have to look at as much of the, the extra duties and well not duties because they're not duties but uh, workload and remove as much as you can um, to allow them to focus on that um, the preparation for courses um, again increases because it's a new thing they're having to cover the the national fours and fives from last year and improve upon that and one of the main uh, comments that members fed back to us recently was that the acceptance that there was a lot more available than there had been last year, but that even still something will come out and then the, the content will change, and so they're teaching something that's then changing again and so on. So it's this constantly having to revise what you do, not being able to rely on your skills of, well, I've taught this for a few years and I know what I'm doing, because everything's changing, having to, to chase to keep up with it. And I mean... In order for the new qualifications to be successful, they clearly have to be implemented as well as they can. And it's our view that that needs to take time and it needs to be given more time than is actually available at the moment. And I think there's a danger that if you rush through, the one example being the new advanced hire, everyone coming to that next year, then you're going to miss a trick somewhere and cause issues further down the line. So we're not saying that, the you know... The, the workload will always be high because that's the nature of, of the job. But the evidence that we have at the moment is that more and more is just being piled on without the weeding out of perhaps less important things than were previously thought. Well, just to check that, in some respects, that, um, as well as all the things that, that Jane's spoken about, we now have a government commitment in terms of working towards using data to reduce the attainment gap. Uh, with very little consideration as to who will actually need to be doing the analysis, how that will actually impact in terms of teachers. The, the fundamental question that um, teachers always ask is, what do I not to do? And very often, whether it's pressures from local authorities, pressures within schools from head teachers in terms of their accountability, very few things are actually taken off. I know that, that Larry spoken previously about um, uh, when he was uh, in his previous role, his head teacher saying, you know, we're going to remove things from the improvement plan this year in order to focus on the new qualifications and what, you know, should actually be the school's priorities. That's not happening enough in our experience, that things are just being added constantly and constantly. And whilst people are, are struggling to try and um, find their feet, something else is going to come along. You know, we've spoken a lot about... Um, implementation of new qualifications. What we've not spoken about are the changes to pedagogy, the changes to teachers' practice, the uh, development of, of new technology and implementation of new technology in, in approaching that. And all of these things, we're asking teachers to do these things and more and tick all the boxes, complete all the forms um, that are, you know, we've always asked them to do. And again, I would echo what previous said, pre uh, folk have said previously, that we're not seeing a reduction now that if systems are going to be looked at in terms of local authorities tracking and target setting, well, that's great, but they've got a budgetary commitment to that. They've got a contract in terms of a system. They can't suddenly undo that because a, a bureaucracy report says we maybe need to do less of this. So it's the actual impact that's not happening in terms of people's daily work, uh, in terms of seeing a reduction in the burdens that are placed on them or the expectations that are placed on them. I think, I think, uh, 
One of, one of the key elements that came out in terms of uh, implementation of curriculum for excellence, and it's repeated in some of the submissions here, is the question of over-assessment. And at the time it was discussed previously, uh, there seemed to be an indication that that was a one-off, that uh, as more confidence came in about the process, that that would fall away, and therefore the workload for teachers would drop considerably. Is that, is that, uh, is that the case? If we're talking particularly about the qualifications, um, then uh, that isn't the case. I mean, the National 4, National 5, there was a, an issue around over-assessment as a result of pupils having to do National 4 and National 5, um, where they might have more productively just focused on their National 5 qualification. Um, but interestingly, speaking to Jana just before we came in, and I said one of the key issues um, around around the qualifications is that the unit assessment uh, is perceived by teachers as being excessive. Um, and the, the, one of the key objectives of the senior phase was to reduce the burden of assessment on both staff and pupils. Now, we, that objective has not been achieved because the unit assessments are perceived by teachers as actually being more laborious than the previous unit assessments that existed around intermediate one, two and higher. Um, and the intermediate one, two and higher previously, the unit assessments uh, were replicated much of what would be in the exam paper, so there was a, an element of practice around, around them. Um, the unit assessment uh, that is meant to be in place was, you know, the, the objective is to get to the point where that is actually, that is a teacher's professional judgment based upon the class work that is there. The difficulty is the pressure around the introduction, the timetable around the introduction, has not allowed for schools to assimilate that message or to, or to adopt the kind of pedagogical changes that, that Robert referred to in terms of implementing that. So what's happened in schools is that people are looking in, in nearly all subjects at three unit assessments and trying to factor them in. Uh, unit assessments tend to happen towards the end of a course because, you know, except for maybe science or maths where the, the content determines the, the units. But in a skills-based course like English, they tend to come towards the end of the course so that pupils have had the most opportunity to develop their skills. And what that leads to in schools, and it's what's happening just now, is that pupils are going in and, you know, on every second day they're having to do a unit assessment to get through all the unit assessments in all of their subjects. So that then creates a weariness amongst the pupils, which is not the best preparation for, uh, you know, that sitting their exams come May. So, no, so absolutely, and, and the, the uh, Reflections Group, which reviewed the first year, have identified the need to actually address that objective, actually reducing the level of assessment that takes place in the course. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an objective that has not been realised at all. In fact, I would say the experience of most pupils is that assessment has actually increased under the new qualification regime rather than uh, decreased as, as was intended. Just to clarify, sorry. Yeah, can I, can I just um, um, follow up from that? Um, what Larry has just articulated is actually, uh, it's probably what's, what's being seen on the ground and was seen on the ground last year. But I think what he also said was the, the aim of the new assessment was to capture um, the material that, that students were generating during the course of their, of their work, which would then be able to be used to make sure that they, they had actually passed the units. That is the goal, and that is the direction of travel. And I think uh, we, did, we did learn from last year that teachers were uh, trying to assess uh, in, in a very um, probably overstructured way. So during the course of this session, this, this term, uh, the, the last term rather, what we did in terms of um, the, the, the verification rounds that we had done last year, we did not do verification, it's what I mentioned earlier. What we did was we did training on unit assessments. So we have focused the nominees that we, that we train that then go out and disseminate that information into the schools. We have worked with them extensively to try and make sure that they understand the approach to unit assessment so that we do actually allow this year to be one in which we move down that road of moving to the point where we're actually assessing material on an ongoing basis and not doing individual assessments for individual outcomes. Did you have any comment, Graham? 
Yes, yes. I was just going to, to add that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a programme of seeing all secondary head teachers across the country and, and deputies. And in fact, this is a, a key area for discussion. We're seeing some really good practice where schools are looking at sort of assessment hotspots across the year. So by looking across a year group, is there points in the year where children are getting too, too much assessment and then they're changing the rhythm of assessment at school level. Um, and that, that's working very well where schools are looking at that. And it's all back to the design design of the curriculum and again at these events we're showcasing really strong practice where schools have updated their assessment policy and strategies based on national advice to significantly reduce the burden of assessment and to get assessment as part of, of teaching and learning. And remember, that's a key um, aspect of the broad general education, so from ages 3 to 15. Um, teachers make overall judgments about children's progress, and that's recognised you know, internationally um, from the OECD and others as a really positive thing because it's not introducing lots of tests with perverse incentives but we're investing a lot in building up teachers' confidence to make judgments based on, on, on classwork. And, you know, we see that as a real strength um, of Curriculum for Excellence, certainly through those broad general education phase. And, of course, we're still supporting teachers to increase their understanding of standards and expectations, and that will continue to be something we'll all be working in partnership to do. Um, Gordon. Just a couple of supplementaries based on what Colin's been speaking about. We've heard a lot this morning about teachers' workload and the bureaucracy levels, etc. And I was struck by one of the comment or a couple of the comments that is in the submission by Jane's Union. Um, paragraph 15 says the union acknowledges the work of the CFE Management Board Working Group in this regard, but remains concerned that some local authorities have done very little to action the recommendations of both the Tackling Bureaucracy and Reflections report. Given that these recommendations were published in November 2013, is there any underlying reason that you're aware of, of why the recommendations are not being implemented? Jean? We're looking at, and, and as Larry referred to earlier, the group has met again since and realised that. I mean, that was part of the point I made earlier. The recommendations we all applauded and were part of the, the negotiation around them. Um, but again, it's with pressures on uh, local authorities from all aspects as well. You know, they, they have to be, I think, emphasised to the point where, you know, you have no option but to do this. Because until the bureaucracy is reduced and the teacher's workload becomes more manageable, um, the system is just not going to flow properly. And I think that it, you know, we need to, to emphasise both, the, both the, the report's recommendations and do a bit of work ourselves along with other uh, agencies to assess. And we, we did get the report from each local authority recently, but the, me the members we are speaking to in that authority aren't aware that this is actually happening. So, you know, we have to unpick that a bit more. Well, given we've got 32 local authorities, mm -hmm. and presumably some of them are implementing the recommendation, why are some implementing the recommendations and others aren't? Because they choose to do that. You know, I, I think it's about how much they are attaching the, the level of importance to it. I mean, it really has to be strongly emphasised that uh, the levels of workload are unsustainable mm -hmm. and we cannot keep asking the profession to keep delivering year on year because they will do their very best to do that was the largely the success of national fours and fives were on the teachers solely delivering what they what they so, could do so so just to be clear so, what you're saying there are some local authorities that are choosing not to tackle the, well, the levels of bureaucracy i couldn't say they're choosing not to they're perhaps not attaching the same level of importance and i think it depends on the local authority and the work that's going on within that i think we'd have to ask each local authority that question i mean i think the um i actually took two rounds of requests before we got replies from all 32 local authorities. Um, and there are some good examples in terms of what local authorities have done. Perth and Kinross have reduced their uh, development plan to three three objectives. Uh, so it means they've parked some things which are you know important, but they've recognised that we, we have to focus on uh, a, a reduced number of objectives to, to concentrate on them. Um, there are a number of, if you, if you read through the documents, there are a number of others um, 
which caused me to say that it, I hadn't seen so much creative writing since I stopped marking higher English, uh, you know, because the, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and, and I think it's a question of priorities. I mean, nobody, there's, there's no one who is resistant to the idea that we should tackle bureaucracy, but it's a question of priorities. And sometimes it's, it's people are, are kind of thorough to uh, the way they're currently doing things. Uh, you know, and it takes a, something to shake that up. Now, what, what the Tackling Bureaucracy Working Group uh, intends to do is to reissue the key messages, but it is going to exemplify from the good practice that's come back from local authorities. Here, here is a practical way in which you can do this um, in order to try and uh, trigger some action, because where uh, our survey indicated from our reps that where schools had actually spent time discussing the report, it had... Re it had uh, uh, had the consequence of actually seeing some some progress in, in terms of tackling the bureaucracy. So the key messages are there, but it, it is this thing about everybody's overworked, you know, from directors down, everybody is overworked. So it's actually managing to get their attention around this agenda is the important agenda. Um, and I think that's where, you know, some authorities have not addressed it as thoroughly as we would hope. Some schools have not addressed it as thoroughly as we'd hoped. Um, the, the relaunch uh, is intended to try and uh, underline those key messages and get some progress on that, because I think there is a willingness to, to tackle it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, just, just to say, obviously, we've made, through the school inspection progr uh, programme, our expectations here are very, very clear that inspectors will look at planning and assessment and they will challenge any unnecessary bureaucracy. And, in fact, it's been a main point for action in one school. It's been mentioned to, to several others. So there's an absolute commitment to do that. Also, in terms of our own online service, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be launching a new website um, and, and by the end of March, which is streamlining the advice and support um, to schools, trying to illustrate ways in which uh, planning and assessment can be reduced. And there's a number of very helpful case studies. Um, in November, uh, we saw about 800 primary practitioners, so around 40% of Scotland's primary school head teachers. And again, a main focus of that conference was reducing bureaucracy. So we had a head teacher, for example, from Dumfries and Galloway showcasing how she had significantly reduced teachers' planning to improve um, time available for teaching and learning. So I think there's a real major um, national effort um, to, to take this forward and we are seeing progress and I think we would want to continue through our area lead officers who work with each of the 32 local authorities to increase further the sort of scrutiny around this agenda now that we have the statements from the local authorities to really improve the consistency in the way that they're taking the recommendations forward. Gordon, do you have any uh, comment? And, and again, it's referring to the written evidence that I referred to earlier. Paragraph 10 said, some problems that are arisen as a result of poor practices that originated in schools. And I'm just wondering what's been done to address poor practice in schools about trying to resolve the uh, bureaucracy and what level? I mean, is there a lack of leadership and what is the situation? I think it is about exemplifying, you know, what is what is better practice. Um, and uh, I mean, we've had a number of joint uh, sessions with EIS and Education Scotland, uh, where we're, we've looked in practical and practical workshops at schools which are developing good practice. And I think if you can actually, rather than just saying, "Well, this is poor," you're actually saying, "Well, here's a different way of doing it." Yeah then that, that's going to be more productive. But it, it's, it's about schools talking to it's about everyone talking to one another because, interestingly, one of the things that the Targeting Bureaucracy Working Group identified as one of the key drivers of workload uh, was a system called On Track With Learning, which is an IT system, which, despite it, the best intentions around its design, was clearly identified as one of the main drivers of workload because of the, the, the capacity. And... Some of the local authorities in the response indicated they were reviewing their use of that or streamlining the use of it. Two local authorities in the response actually said they were tackling bureaucracy by introducing on track with learning. And you're, and you're saying, does nobody talk to one another? You know, this was identified as the problem. And two people, two authorities were saying, here's the solution. Uh, they're, they're, a letter is on their way. On the way you know, but, they, but it is that thing about you know, exec sharing the practice. Yeah so that we're focusing on the things that work, rather than making the same mistakes again. Sorry, Robert, just a very quick point. 
so much of what we're talking about, whether it's in terms of <clears throat> advice to local authorities or schools to reduce bureaucracy, <laughs> advice to teachers as to how to improve their practice, or advice to teachers in terms of supporting uh, pupils, it's the same thing. We need exemplification, we need a shared understanding of what works and what doesn't work, and the time available at all levels for people to share practice with one another. So much of the development opportunities that teachers have are on, on their own behest, whether it's through online things like Pedigoo, uh, a website where teachers collaborate and share their practice with one another. Um, we need to provide every and any opportunity for people to reflect on where they are. And I would echo what, what Jane said earlier on, that even within a school, having the time, for example, with the head teacher and the two union reps to sit down and say, let's look at this report, let's see what we can do, to then have a discussion within departments as to, OK, what bureaucracy do we not do? Well, if I'm the head teacher and I want to make sure that I'm uh, quality assured in the work of the school, I'll have bureaucracy that, that relates to that. Um, if, similarly, if a, a department head wants to do that, so which parts of these things are we going to sacrifice to get to the, you know, the absolute core of what needs to be done in order that people can get on with the job of, of teaching and learning um, to the best of their ability and um, with the best resource that they've got available to them? Thank you very much. Uh, Siobhan. Thank you. Mr. Logan, I heard you um, talk about the survey results of parents um, and their experience roughly about schools. Um, you said that you work with the National Parent Forum of Scotland and, and they obviously made a submission to us for today. And at 2.3, they say that many parents feel that they have not been sufficiently involved in the decisions about which hires are being offered and they do not have enough information about what is happening. Um, now, clearly, that's the National Forum saying that, the people that you said that, that you work with. Um, so... Given that I've read both the survey results and I've read their submission, it leads me to think that most parents are satisfied with what their school's doing, but they're, they're asking for leadership from those above the school. Would that be correct in saying so? Um, I think that o overall satisfaction rates amongst parents are, are very high, as I discussed earlier, and that's um, f evident from the survey results. That's, uh, a culmination of primary and secondary schools from across Scotland based on, on a national sample. So, as I was saying earlier, 91% strongly agree or agree that they're happy with the school. 77% also agree or strongly agree the school keeps them well informed about their child's progress. And you're, yeah, so you're. A main area of focus for us has to been to work with the National Parent Forum to provide uh, national support and advice uh, around this. So I talked about the, the nutshells and, and the other work. I think that we've got to recognise that most parents get most most of their information from their own school. That, that's the, 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 the source that they engage with most and talking with their own teachers and their own head teachers is really important. So the National Parent Forum has a very strong network of local reps who work with parent forums and schools. And we, I think we all continue to, to work together um, to, to strengthen that and to improve it further. Um, there has been a lot of discussion at school level about which um, higher course to pursue, whether it's the existing or the new higher. Um, and the evidence suggests that teachers have made that decision based on their own local context and their own lo local circumstances. And that's one of the benefits of Curriculum for Excellence, that a lot of the decisions are made at local level. And I think, you know, that was a decision that was made some time ago. Young people are now most of the way through those courses. And there's very much a recognition that all the higher qualifications, and remember we've seen a record number of um, entries for hire again this year, they all have the same value and the same currency. And in fact, on the certificate, it will say higher um, English. You won't differentiate between the two. So the standard um, of the courses are, are there, and teachers have made that decision locally based on a whole variety of factors. Parents are looking for leadership out with the schools. I mean, that was the question. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and given that only 40 or just over 40 percent responded to the survey, um, that's the cause for concern there. So, so I, I mean, think, the evidence yeah. this morning, obviously, we've had an hour and a bit on the new hire, yeah. the advanced hire. I'm trying to okay. go further than that yeah. and, and trying to get to the points of okay. where we should be looking. Should right. we be going to the local authorities, okay. asking for more support there? Right. If parents are if 42% of parents are saying we'll respond to a survey and we think our school's doing OK, but the National Parent Forum is saying but we haven't got the information that we require, then where should the pertinent questions be? 
I think, you know, a strength in terms of leadership that parents are looking for is the National Parent Forum are, are on all the national body, uh, national groups, are on the, the CFE management board. We work closely with them. So I think we're always trying to, to look at new ways of working together to, to strengthen communication. I think a lot of progress has been made with communication, but we still will continue to work on that. Okay. In your submission, um uh, on the primary specific support, you mentioned that you worked with 16 local authorities since October to provide primary specific support. I was just wondering why those 16, because there's no information as to why those 16 okay. um, were chosen. Sure. Um, that, that the support, um, the tailored support for different schools and local authorities comes through requests from our area lead officers who've, who develop a partnership agreement with each council on what is it that they want from us in terms of uh, tailored support for the, their own local needs. In primary schools, for example, where there hasn't been a positive inspection, um, there'll be a tailored package of support around what that school needs with ourselves and the local authority in order to improve further. So the priorities at any point in time for a local authority is based on that partnership agreement and that discussion about what they need. So that's the targeted support and then there's the universal support that's available to everyone. So the targeted support, they would make the case to you rather than yeah. the other way about? Yeah, a yeah. discussion would take place on that, absolutely, okay. between a, a officer and that local authority. That's, that's helpful, thank you. Um, on another subject, in the Wood Commission, um, we've seen the requirement of careers advice and employers going into school and, and that drive that will continue over the next few years um, for schools to implement that through, obviously, um, the Curriculum for Excellence, but in other ways as well. I was just wondering, in the careers advice that's on offer, do we think that face-to-face -face careers advice is best or, or should we be looking at other approaches? Um, so, Larry, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we have um, discussed this uh, previously. Um, we, we are certainly concerned that the cuts that have taken place uh, around the careers advisory service in schools um, and the, the introduction of the, the traffic light system where the only guaranteed face-to-face -face interview is if you are uh, a red uh, on the traffic light system. Um, uh, we, accept, we acknowledge that there are there's been a lot of good work done in terms of world of work and the, the use of uh, online programmes to support young people making, making their choices. But the, the, the big there is a concern um, that the, the service uh, has been cut back to the point where its ability to support the sustained destinations agenda around senior phase and around the Woods Commission, um, you, you know, it's, it's been slightly, slightly marginalised. Um, the, the Woods Commission, I think, helpfully builds upon the objectives of the senior phase, particularly in relation to those young people who previously might have disengaged from education. Um, you know, and one of the other areas that we have to, I know you're looking particularly at national fi uh, hire this morning. But one of the other areas that needs to be have some attention paid to it is uh, that the group of pupils who, at the end of the broad general education, are, are not looking to do a suite of national qualifications, but are perhaps looking at an alternative route. Uh, CFE Senior Phase opens up the possibility for those young people, for example, to transfer their final year of schooling into a, a college environment. Uh, or to look at um, uh, a, a, an apprenticeship route um, or as, a, as a career avenue. Uh, and in fact, that was one of the big objectives of, of the whole senior phase. Um, and uh, that actually really has been marginalised in terms of the focus on qualifications. Um, and qualifications are part of the options here as well. But I, I, I think that uh, Woods potentially uh, might be a catalyst to uh, more attention being paid to that particular agenda. Um, around uh, around alternatives to the university route, which you know is where a lot of the debate has been uh, been previously, and we are certainly keen to see that develop. The one the one point I'd make around that is that it's simply a fact that over the last few years, school college liaison budgets have been cut. So if we actually want to build upon that aspect of the the options for young people, it, it, it needs to be funded. I don't want to get in a huge debate about this because we have covered it in a, in a recent evidence, full evidence session, but I'm more than happy to take views from Janet and, and Graham. Yeah, um, 
In, in terms of um, the availability of career counselling, I think I think you have to have multiple channels. I think face-to-face -face works for some people. My world of work works for others. I think that the, the whole... Um, Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda really does help in terms of bringing employers into the school, getting the school engaged with local employers, which does in effect broaden the opportunity for, for kids to be able to know what's going on. In terms of what they do in the senior phase, uh, Larry is absolutely right. CFE is very, very broad and should be broad and really dovetails well. So taster courses like Skills for Work, national courses doing HNCs, HNDs, either in the school or with the college, I think is something that's really very positive because the different pathways are very important but people will only choose different pathways if they know they exist and if they know where it's going to lead them so I do think that engagement with local businesses is very very key to this as well. Graeme if you could be brief. Yeah, just to answer Mr McMahon's question directly I think a variety of different approaches work so yes face-to-face -face career coaching is helpful as Janet was saying um, also my world of work also we have to remember that young people's careers choices are hugely influenced by their parents and teachers so we're looking at new ways of, of teachers working together um, with careers coaches um, and we actually launched a, a new model of inspection looking in a local area at the quality of careers information and guidance that's available from all the different partners for young people. So that's in a pilot phase just now, but it's intended to improve further the quality of uh, career support that young people get. And just finally, on uh, Mr Logan's point about teachers being influential um, in careers guidance, do you think, given what you've said, Mr McMillan, this morning about what teachers are required to do, the workloads that are already there, the continuous assessments, um, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, that they have the capacity at the minute to then take that role? A lot of teachers will be doing that, but you know we've heard in previous evidence that that obviously the capacity to do that might not necessarily be there. Do you think that's the case? In order, I mean, would some um, reported in December, the implementation, sorry, the Scottish Government's um, response was in December, so that added to it. Um, do you think we've already got the capacity to help with that? I think it, it depends, I mean, because in, in some respects it's looking at the links that exist in terms of, say, as Larry said, school college links that are available in terms of um, that avenue, the opportunities for young people to access a careers advisor, but also the capacity of the school's guidance staff in terms of the work that they do at various points in terms of course choice. So I think that there are um, tremendous um, opportunities and routes to, to get the information to young people. A number of schools, in my experience, have looked at developing opportunities in terms of employability. There's a number of schools that are doing a lot of good work with local employers that are kind of sector leading in terms of what they're doing. The issue and the challenge, therefore, is how do you spread that to the other schools? You know, and because what it's dependent upon is the buy-in from local employers. In terms of my own school, Loch Ely High School in Fife, you know, we've been affected recently as a local employer has just closed with the loss of 180 jobs, the Tesco and Kirkcaldy is closing again with the loss of nearly 200 jobs. These are the sorts of circumstances where these are the, the sorts of employers that would be looking to come into schools to work with our young people, whether it's in terms of interview skills, whether it's in terms of um, job applications and the sorts of things that we really want to work with them to do. But the positive destination might not be there at the end of the day if we don't have the avenues for training, if we don't have the avenues for college places, if we don't have the avenues for all the things that we're doing in schools to lead to a positive destination at the end of the day. I think that in some respects is where the challenge is. But you're right in, in terms of your question that the, there are tremendous constraints on all the agencies and all the agents that are trying to support our young people in making the best career choices and decisions for themselves in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got very little time and I've still got three members who want to come in, so we're going to have to be quick. Uh, questions and answers, uh, Chick, and then Mark, and then George. Um, we talked of communication. And, you know, when I listened to some of the answers today, written them down, it, you know, I question how much communication there is at the senior level uh, of achieving our objectives. I, I mean, Larry says progress has been patchy. Graham says that you know, things are improving. Um, we hear about look, some local authorities doing what they you know doing what they're supposed to do. Some local authorities not, and there might be a shame and blame a, a mechanism somewhere in there. Just wonder, uh, Mr. Logan, based on the Education Scotland implementation plan, are you going to achieve the outcomes that are in there? And how much communication have you had with the, the rest of the body in the working group? to ensure that these outcomes are established. And can I suggest that on an a priori basis, 
that you look at these in terms of seeing where we can get the biggest bang for our buck in ensuring that local authorities uh, implement uh, those areas, those changes that will reduce major elements of bureaucracy as quickly as possible. Okay. Are you going to achieve the outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be worth just remembering that Curriculum for Excellence is based on a broad national framework which is developed locally, so that's a deliberate design feature that schools and local authorities have more autonomy within that broad national framework to design a curriculum that meets the needs of, of lo different uh, groups of young people. And certainly through our inspection programme and other engagement, that's a thing that we look at and we evaluate. You know, what is the story of the curriculum in this area? How have teachers and others worked together to, to maximise the autonomy so I think that that's important to bear that in mind. I think it's also worth saying that I think a real strength of our approach is the partnership working um, across the different agencies. We don't always all agree. Um, there, there, you know, there's challenges, but through the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board, the implementation group, all the different national groups, we're actually all working together. Um, Larry mentioned... Larry. Well, that's a local authority in terms of the, the ways in which they're reducing bureaucracy. The progress um, there has been, been patchy, as, as we discussed earlier. But we do joint events, Larry mentioned earlier, joint national events with the EIS and ourselves to look at the best practice in, in reducing bureaucracy um, as well. So, uh, yes, I think by continuing to work together, we will achieve the outcomes um, that we've set. And I think it's recognised as a strength of the approach to CFE that we are all uh, genuinely trying to work together. And, and communicate. Okay. Robert. Which is that um, for several um, years ago, the SST was removed from the CFE management board. And one of the ways that perhaps we could have a greater involvement and support our partners is in those councils that exist at a national level to get a place back at the table. Larry. <laughs> I, I, I would uh, support that, although we actually think the CFE Management Board should be winding up soon, uh, you know, because we've got to stop implementing at some point. Um, you should come on just at the just, uh, come, on, come, come on to say cheerio. Um, the, the, the day. The, <laughs> the, just two, two, two very, very quick points. Um, I, I think there is, you know, one of the one of the issues around Scottish education that doesn't exist south of the border, for example, is that there is a genuine... Uh, social dialogue around education policy and we, we wouldn't complain about um, not having opportunities to put our position to either Education Scotland or SQA or, 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 or Scottish Government. Um, we think they should listen to us more often but we certainly get the opportunity uh, to, to engage with them. I, I, I genuinely think one of the issues that we'll, we'll have to look at in the future is, and this is potentially where the, I think there's a, a communication gap is the translating national policy into local action uh, because the although ADES are represented in all these bodies, COSLA as a group usually defer to ADES uh, in terms of representation. And I think an, a number of the issues in the Tacting Bureaucracy is a classic example of it. In, in the Tacting Bureaucracy Working Group, you have all the teacher unions, you have COSLA, you have ADES, Education Scotland, SQA, Scottish Government, everyone signed up to all those key messages. And yet, when those messages are going out, there's an implementation gap when it goes to local authorities because local authorities, as the employer, often have their own, their own priorities, their own agenda. So I, I think that's where you know, the, there's, a, there's an issue to be addressed in the future. Janet, did you want to...? Just a really quick thing to say. I, I think communication across the people involved in implementing CFE is absolutely critical. Um, and we do have very challenging conversations, and I don't think anybody's shy in saying what they are able to do, what they need, what what they really think are problems. And, and I think it is, it is one of the good things, agreeing with Larry. Uh, it is the best thing about Scottish education that we do actually talk to each other. Okay, thank you. Mark. Thanks, Mayor. Just a, a few brief questions about the, the uptake of the, the new hire. Scottish ministers had previously said that they didn't expect um, a large proportion of pupils um, to stick with the, the old hire, and given that the organisations here today I would expect to be feeding into the Scottish minister's opinion on that, just to ask um, whether members of the panel expected um, as many as 45% of pupils to stick to the old hire. 
Members, member survey that we undertook in the autumn, we're currently surveying our members again. Uh, the response was that 60% um, of folks would be pressing ahead with the new hire and 40% would be continuing with the old hire. So in some respects, the, the, the recent figures that, that Janet has produced um, sort of are in line with that in terms of what the expectations are, but perhaps not with the, the degree of, of accuracy as it's turned out. But th that was based... Um, on a, a sample of our members rather than the entire cohort. So I think that explains the difference, but it certainly was the case in terms of what people were expecting to do as something like a 40 to 45% sort of retaining of the, the previous um, system rather than moving ahead to the, to the new one. I think um, it came as no surprise because I think, um, depending on the subject area as well, also that affected whether it was the old or new hire and the course content and so on. Um, where teachers were actually asked their opinion, the vast majority have stuck with the old hire, and I think that's that's quite a telling um, uh, statistic. Whereas some uh, areas just made a, a blanket decision to, to uh, fire on with the new hire. Um, so the the issues, not issues, but the differential between the different subjects, I think that's quite uh, interesting to look at. You know where they've tended to stick with the old biology is particularly one subject where virtually no one felt ready to progress for the reasons that we've outlined in previous sessions. So um, it also gives teachers the chance to, to consolidate the work that they did last year and to move on, as I say, with the new hire next year. But I cannot stress strongly enough how important it is to consider a delay to the advanced hire for the, those sitting old hire this year. I think what, uh, for teachers to be able to make that choice was, was the right and appropriate decision to be made because teachers, as we all un understand and know, are the ones who understand what's best for their, for their students. In consultation with their parents, I think they've made uh, appropriate choices. Uh, I think the difference between um, the subjects that have had significant change versus the subjects that arguably um, are ones that people are getting excited about the change in the new qualifications, the difference in, in the number of staying with the existing hire and moving to the new hire is, is pretty explainable. But it is, across, it is very different for different schools. You can go to one school where the vast majority of subjects that they're undertaking are new hires and they're making very specific decisions about why and understand why they are sticking with the existing ones. And I think that's the important thing. It's teacher's judgment. It's the fact that they are professionals. They know what they're doing. They know what's best. We can handle whatever the, the, the mix is and I, and I think it's an appropriate thing to have done. Can I just check before I come on to Larry? Janet, that, that seems at odds with what Jane has just said. Jane used the word blanket to describe the decisions being made. But you seem to be suggesting, which was certainly, I think, our understanding that it was a, a decision about flexibility based on in a very individual set of circumstances, but whether they move on to the new hire or whether they stick with the old hire. What, why is there a difference of view here? My understanding is that it is being made by teachers and schools in a consultation with the parents. I said I would come to Larry next, so Larry. Yeah, um, just on that point, the, um, I think all local authorities in theory allowed a delegation of decision-making to schools, uh, and most did in practice. I think in some local authorities, our members would say there was significant pressure put on through the head teacher network for principal teachers to go with a new hire. Um, but, but the, you know, by and large, I think um, most local authorities allowed a, a delegation down. Just, just, I, I, we were a little surprised in the EIS at, at the the balance of the the new hire, old hire. Um, people should bear in mind, however, that within that uh, forty five percent for the existing hire, you also have all the six year presentations, and all of the six year presentations will be the old hire uh, automatically. So, the actual balance is. You know, slightly higher in terms of those who had a fifth-year option. Um, and the, the point I would really want to emphasise in terms of communicating key messages is to reiterate what Graham said earlier. Um, the, the higher is the higher. It makes no difference to young people in terms of their future prospects, whether they're sitting the new higher or the old higher. What makes a difference whether they pass it or not? 
um, you know, but the um, any suggestion, I did see some in the papers that somehow some people will be disadvantaged if they start a different hire. When revised hire was introduced back in 2001, we had dual running between hire still and, and the old hire, and it didn't make it didn't make a bit of a difference. They're at the same SQ, SEQF level, um, and you know, in terms of communicating to parents, uh, they shouldn't be concerned as to whether which hire they're doing. I think that's really important because we don't want youngsters to be uh, panicked. And I'm glad you I'm glad you said it. Um, Graham, did you have a comment to make? Yeah, just to come back to Mr. Griffin's original point, I think we were always um, expecting it to be a mixed picture, and I think at previous sessions we did say we wouldn't know the figures until we had the SQA provisional data. Um, but certainly the, we were did 45 visits to secondary schools between September and December, and teachers have appreciated, as Larry said, that. Um, flexibility locally. The, the robustness of how the decision um, was made um, did, did vary to some extent. However, as Janet said, um, the evidence that we've got overall suggests that it was made locally in, in line with um, what the individual circumstances of the school were. And there were a whole range of individual factors that I've covered in the paper here. Um, I think you know it's really important to emphasise Larry's point that the higher is the gold standard. It will have the same currency and value as young people move forward. It's internationally recognised and we have a higher number of entries once again this year but up by about another 5% than we've had before. So standards and ambitions are, are rising further. Um, I'm going to, did you have, is that a very specific it's point? A very specific point. Just to remind everyone that the figures are provisional, they are not finalised yeah. figures and uh, as long as everyone is aware about that. Oh, okay, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, and Robert, did, uh, you did indicate, I don't know whether it's been covered there. It's been covered, okay, thanks. Mark, sorry. Um, Dr. Brown, you've touched on this already. It was just a question around the, the variance um, across subjects of uh, pupils taking the, the new hire and um, sticking to the old hire. Just to ask a question about um, drilling down into the reasons for that, whether that's just because a particular subject lends itself well to, to translate to the new hire or um, whether there was some support issues with um, some of the STEM subjects perhaps in moving to the new hire. Just if you have any comments as to why there's such a, a wide variation across subjects of pupils taking new hire versus old hire. Just before you answer, can I back up Mark there? And, 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 the, and the reason I want to ask a sort of supplementary on Mark's question is the point that I think, Graham, you made earlier on, um, which slightly concerned me, and it was also in your written evidence about the, the fact that um, the STEM subjects in particular did require, you know, were, were overdue an update, maybe a, I'm paraphrasing there, but effectively, could you explain that when you're answering uh, Mark's question? Sorry, Janet. Um, can I first and foremost say, uh, just remind everyone how the hires were developed? The hires were developed in consultation with teachers, with employers, with universities, with colleges. So not only the people who are delivering the course, but also the people who are going to be receiving the students who've undertaken and achieved the qualification. So they're very much around what is needed in terms of skills and knowledge that would take that individual from the, from the point of hire into the next destination, whether that's school, college, or university. So yes, it's, it's not surprising that since we did the uh, hire still, uh, qualifications that there was change, particularly in the science subjects, because that's obviously an area that moves a lot faster than, than other areas. I won't mention English because Larry will um, make some copies. But, but I think, so I think from the, from the point of view of content change and uh, to some extent the, the, the skills development, that, that is very specifically in certain subjects. I think the, the teachers that we've talked to have made the, made the decision based on whether they feel confident that they are ready to teach those courses or not, that they are uh, able to, um, some of the course has changed significantly and part of the reason why we're doing a lot of CPD around that is to make sure that teachers are as comfortable as, as they should be. I think some of the, some of the other reasons that uh, we're hearing why people have chosen the new qualification is because it's exciting, because they are able to make the learning relevant, that the, uh, the learning can be contextualised for each individual student. So some of the work that's being undertaken in higher now can be individual. Can, can, they, can, they can 
learn a particular aspect of a science subject by undertaking something they're extremely interested in. That is something that new qualifications really enable and really allow. So some of the people are choosing new qualifications because they want to, because they're exciting, they see the opportunity in it. Others are seeing the very smooth transition from National 5 to the new hire. But others are saying, no, we, we really want another year to get this under our belt and we'll go forward next year into the new hire. Okay. Robert. In, in, a, in, my experience, in a small number of cases um, where um, schools and departments had moved on to teach National 4 5, that didn't particularly articulate well with the, the old hire. And so there was automatically a pressure if you'd gone down the road of implementing National 4 5, you had to then implement the new hire because to do so would potentially be detrimental to the, the students you had in front of you, or the content would be so variously different. And so, in some respects, it's the same issue that people are now facing with regards to um, advanced hire in terms of next year. Okay, thank you. All right, Graham. Yeah, just to come back to your point um, specifically, convener, uh, I think it was recognised, particularly in the science community, that you know we do need to update the contents of these um, examinations um, more frequently. So there's uh, new curriculum forums have been set up that will keep curriculum content under review on an ongoing basis, rather than just sort of stopping at a point in time and updating content. Um, so I think that will be really helpful moving forward so that the qualifications do get refreshed and the content gets refreshed as sub Objects move forward. Thank you. Uh, very, very briefly. Um, was just on uh, the point Mr. Flanagan made, and I think it was touched on earlier as well by Dr. Brown about information going out to colleges, universities, and, and employers um, about the um, pupils potentially applying for jobs or, or places um, with the same subject but different hire. What information is going out to employers and institutions um, so they're, they're clear? Um, that it, it's a higher qualification, it's still at that high standard um, and the pupils are still going to have the right skills for that job or, or place. Thank you. Jan, can you explain that? Yes. Um, we're obviously working very closely with the university sector, both north and south of the border, to make sure everyone understands that the, the, the new hire is of the equivalent standard as the old hire, that uh, the nature of the curriculum for excellence is, is um, and making sure that, that the universities across the piece understand that. There's been very, very close interaction for a long period of time with the universities in Scotland on curriculum for excellence, so they're fully aware of the comparability. Uh, UCAS are also um, fully aware of what's going on in terms of the, the entry requirements for universities. Colleges as well. We also have a very significant engagement program with employers across the country in terms of making sure that they understand not only the new hires but also the National 4, National 5 qualifications to make sure that they're, they're aware of the nature of the skills and the knowledge that's being developed and what they should be expecting, what they should be looking for in the new uh, employees that they're going to be hiring. It will say on the certificate, higher English. It will say what it is, which is a higher English or a higher maths. Which I think is point because a higher media. is a higher. Yes. Yes. Um, exactly. It's got the same number of UCAS points. Uh, as all qualifications are, they have a different content. That's fine. Right, thank you very much. George Adam, final question. Convener, I'll just skip my other four or five questions that I had at this stage, Convener. But, uh, Larry brought up a very important point, and I think it's the crux to a lot of the issues that we're talking about here uh, about delivery. You know, you're saying how do we get national policy delivered at local uh, uh, level? Now, as a former councillor, I've sat through hours of education meetings where we talk about best practice and how we can sort it. And from some of the evidence we're getting here, we're still at a situation where we're not actually taking on the best practice from other authorities and other areas as well. And I'm a very practical person. I'm aware that there will be local authorities, as Larry quite likely says, that will create bureaucracy just to actually talk about bureaucracy to try and sort it out. So I'm saying how... Recently, we also had parents groups talking to us during the budget process about how we deliver education at a local level, but that's a debate for another day but it's maybe something to mention at this stage, but how do we actually deal with this situation to get local authorities to start working together to ensure that they actually do take some of the good practices that are out there and ensure that we do get it across the board in all 32 authorities, if possible? Anybody want to solve that one? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I think there's a, there's a couple of key points in that. From an EIS point of view, we, we are very clear that we think local authorities are a key element of our education system. So we think that local democracy is a key part. It's something that's disappearing in England uh, through the academy programme. So we, we wouldn't want to see that um, 
been marginalised in any way. I think there will be a debate um, now that the referendum's out of the way, to be honest. I think there will be a debate moving into the 2016 Scottish elections about the, 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 the mechanisms that might be used to ensure that we are maximising uh, the, uh, the delivery impact of education services. Um, uh, my particular view is uh, one of the bodies that we've got if, uh, as an EIS, one of the bodies we've got limited contact with is the Causal Education Committee, which I think should actually be a key forum for us. But our engagement with COSLA tends to be through the SNCT, which is tends to be focused on what well, is focused on paying conditions. Um, at a local level, uh, some councils have got consultative committees that they look at curricular issues, and some have actually got LNCTs which only look at conditions of service issues. So I, I think it's about creating creating the platforms whereby we're having the education discussions, because I, I, I have absolutely no doubt. I have not met anyone in Scottish education who does not want to deliver a good quality service for young people. Um, so I think it's about actually just creating the platforms where we can share the expertise and share the information. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that at a local authority level, the way education's currently work, the education committees currently work, uh, really embrace that kind, of, that kind of shared agenda. I think uh, sometimes they're, they're far too closed um, and they focus far too much on number crunching uh, around uh, statistics, you know, statistics, rather than thinking about the broader the broader services that should be there. Not a solution, but just you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Janet, yeah, I, I think from the point of view of, of the way we engage with local authorities, we meet with all of the directors of education and the people involved in the delivery on a regular basis to get their feedback, to try and understand what the issues are, to make sure that we tell them what we've learnt to, to again say, you know, this is a good idea, this is... Nominees is a classic example. One of, one of the roles is uh, people come to us, they're, they're, they're trained to be verifiers, to be able to understand standards, really, really uh, get, get to the nub of what it means to teach to a standard. One of the roles of, the, of those people is to go back into the local authority, to go back to the schools and to share that expertise. Some local authorities are using those people really, really, really well. Others are finding it difficult to be able to work out how to do that, or maybe they're, they're, they've got a different approach to it. One of the things we're doing is really trying to show showcase how that's worked in certain areas to try and, again, make sure that people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, that they can actually learn from each other. So from our particular perspective, we, we try and do that with the things that we need uh, the local authorities to be engaged with us on. Thank you. George? You okay? Any, any, any final comment? Well, just uh, if I can, Robert. Um, convener, echo something that Janet said there, which is that for too often I think teachers are engaging not in curricular innovation but on wheel reinvention. And I think what we have to do is find ways of, of that stopping, of ensuring that the collaborative opportunities which can exist are created. And that's um, works not only for classroom teachers within school and between schools, but also clearly works with the other partners that are involved in, in, in the education service throughout the country. But it's something I think, but from a trade union point of view, one of the things that we'll have to think about is how we put pressure on elected members locally um, to come to the table and have these sorts of discussions of the type that Larry was talking about a moment ago. I wasn't, I wasn't going to open this up again, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a final comment, um, uh, convener, because... And it's back to the point I, I, I raised earlier around uh, a practical step forward in terms of uh, resourcing every young person with at least one textbook in relation to the new hire. Um, I, I'm aware that the Cabinet Secretary is, is, is coming in uh, to, to face you next. Um, I, I think about a million would probably cover it. So just well, if you're looking for a, looking for a figure. Yeah. So. She's, <laughs> she's probably got it with her, uh, Larry. Uh, so... Can I thank all of you for coming along this morning and giving your time to the committee? Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, and now I briefly suspend so we can change over the witnesses, and as Larry said, so we can uh, question the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you.
Uh, can I welcome uh, this morning uh, Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, um, and particularly because this is your first appearance before the committee as Cabinet Secretary. Obviously, you've been here before as Minister, but congratulations on your appointment, and we're looking forward to working with you on all of the subjects of mutual interest to both you and the committee. So welcome, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Can I also welcome Alan Johnson, who's the Deputy Director or Learning Director at the Scottish Government. And can I welcome back Graham Logan and Janet Brown as well, who are, who are staying with us for this session. Um, before we begin, can I just indicate to members that uh, if they would just catch my eye, I'll bring them in as soon as possible, uh, and we'll try and cover all the subjects that we can in uh, around an hour um, this morning. Uh, but Cabinet Secretary, um, I believe you've got some opening remarks you want to give us. Indeed, thank you very much, Convener. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, provide the committee this morning with a, an update on Curriculum for Excellence and uh, our progress with the, the new qualifications. Um, but firstly, I do want to reflect more broadly and indeed briefly uh, on my priorities for Scottish education. Uh, particularly, as you say, Convener, this is my first appearance at committee as the Education Secretary, uh, and I hope that this will be useful for committee. The committee, I'm sure, is well aware of the progress that has been made to date uh, in our schools. We have, for example, uh, record exam results, uh, more new and refurbished schools, record number of school leavers and positive destinations. And, of course, all of that is good news. And it's to the, the credit of, of my predecessor and, of course, the immense credit uh, to the thousands working in the front line in the Scottish education system that we have uh, made so much progress uh, and, of course, the hard work of pupils themselves and the support of their parents. Uh, but, of course, convener, this is only a start. Um, I've already said that my number one priority is to raise attainment for all and to close the equity gap. And in the Scotland we seek, your background should never determine uh, how well you do in education or life, yet we know that all too often it still does. So we need to do more, much more, to ensure that all of our children and young people, regardless of their background, uh, have an equal opportunity to <coughs> succeed. And the committee has already heard about our Attainment for All programme. And at a future point, I'll be pleased to provide an update on that programme, as well as the progress that we're making on the Early Years Collaborative Family Nurse Partnership and uh, our quality expansion of childcare. And members will, of course, be aware that the First Minister announced last month uh, that we are providing free school meal for every P123 child in Scotland. And, of course, uh, above all else, that's an investment uh, in our children's future uh, because we want every child to be able to concentrate uh, at school and to be able to achieve his or her best. So, as we go forward, uh, we will be looking for further opportunities to drive up attainment uh, in all of Scotland's school. And, as committee knows, we plan to introduce the Education Bill to Parliament in March, and I want to make sure that it contains measures to address the attainment gap and promote equity for all our children. And it is absolutely right uh, that we back this commitment up with legislation where that is needed and appropriate. Convener, Curriculum for Excellence is the, the best possible framework for us to raise attainment and to close uh, the equity gap. Uh, curriculum for Excellence is now how we do education in Scotland and we are seeing steady improvements uh, in outcomes for more children and young people. And we are now at a, a very important milestone uh, with the curriculum and the introduction of the new qualifications is progressing well. Uh, we've successfully introduced uh, the new nationals last year and we know from the provisional figures provided by SQA that significant numbers of pupils taking hires this year have been studying the new hires. We have planned for this and expected it. And last year, teachers requested flexibility uh, and the Scottish Government was happy to accommodate that. Uh, we know that more young people have been given the chance to sit hires. Uh, provisional entries for hires this year suggest yet another increase. And it is encouraging that these are 5% up on this stage uh, last year. And I'm sure that committee welcomes uh, the fact that more of our young people are, are stretching themselves uh, in our schools. And this shows that ambition more than ever is alive and well in classrooms across Scotland. Uh, but of course, convener, we've got to continue with that momentum. 
to really deliver on the senior phase and the great promise of Curriculum for Excellence. So we must continue to work with our partners and support those uh, on the front line. In my short time as Education Secretary, I have been hugely impressed uh, by the motivation, energy and creativity that I have seen in the schools that I have visited and the student teachers from Glasgow and Strathclyde Universities I met a fortnight ago uh, showed that our next generation of teachers uh, will be just as committed and inspiring for our children and young people. And I saw the same level of commitment during my visit to Craig Royston Community High School last week as well. So clearly Scotland is blessed with a, an outstanding and highly professional teaching workforce that has gone the extra mile in getting curriculum for excellence to where it is. Uh, Education Scotland will continue to provide schools with the materials and support our teachers need at every step of the way and that level of support will be vital um, for curriculum for excellence if it's to match up to the expectations and ambitions uh, of our young people. So, convener, in everything that I do as Education Secretary, my focus will be on the children and young people themselves. Uh, that will be the basis uh, of everything and will inform uh, absolutely every decision uh, that I take in this post. And I, for one, and I'm sure it's an aspiration shared by everybody in this committee, uh, that we won't rest until we can be assured uh, that each and every child has the best chances through Curriculum for Excellence and the very best of education. So, thank you, convener, and uh, I'm Looking forward to uh, questions from committee. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Before I um, uh, move to questions from members, I've got one myself, which comes directly from Larry Flanagan. I don't know whether you noticed some of the evidence that uh, went just before you, but uh, Mr Flanagan uh, made a specific request. He said it was a, a practical measure the government could take, which we, I'm not quite sure where the figure comes from, but he said he, he was looking for a million pounds for extra funding for textbooks for the new hire. What's the government's view on that? Well, as always, uh, the government listens very closely uh, to the, the EIS. Um, we will give that uh, suggestion by Mr Flanagan um, all due consideration. We have in the past uh, accommodated such requests. I think Mr Russell, um, at the tail end of uh, 2013, um, had uh, allocated a million pounds uh, to, uh, for a similar purpose for resources. Um, I haven't, convener, come here um, with my purse or my chequebook. You will understand that. Um, and finances are, of course, uh, very tight and constrained. But I can give committee and the IS an undertaking that the government will certainly um, go away and look very closely at that pragmatic suggestion. Thank you very much. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, the, the, a recurring theme has been uh, complaints about teachers' workloads and specifically the workload uh, around the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence. Now, there appeared in previous sessions to be an indication that that was expected to uh, lessen as Curriculum for Excellence buried in. But uh, today we were clearly told that uh, that's not the case and that the workload, in fact, is getting worse. Um, I wondered um, whether what the Scottish Government had done in terms of analysing teachers' workloads and whether there were any proposals to reduce it. It's not in anybody's interest, not least uh, our children or indeed teachers themselves, to be um, overburdened, um, whether that's with, with, with bureaucracy. And in terms of workload issues for teachers, we do take that very, very seriously. Um, and that's why there is the Tackling Bureaucracy uh, Working Group. Uh, Dr Allen uh, chairs that group, uh, met uh, last week. Um, and certainly with the Curriculum for Excellence, we have seen, I mean, speaking in general terms now, you know, that move uh, to more assessment because, you know, exams aren't uh, the only focus um, of measuring uh, learning and attainment. Um, and certainly uh, the programme board uh, produced what they call a, a reflections report um, and it's certainly true to say that uh, a point of learning from the past year um, is that there has been over assessment and that isn't in the interest uh, either of teachers uh, or our pupils. So the SQA um, have taken steps to uh, reduce by over a third uh, the assessment verification and I will ask Janet to, to speak a bit more um, about that but this uh, workload issue and over assessment issue is also 
a matter that Education Scotland uh, take very seriously uh, when they are inspecting uh, schools and w schools as well. But it is an area that we have to be uh, very vigilant to. So I'll ask Janet to talk about um, how the SQA have reduced the, the assessment burden. Um, I think it's, it's partly what we discussed in the earlier session around the fact that we uh, last year had three rounds of verification of internal assessment within the school. Uh, and what we did as a result of looking at how can we maintain standards, but how can we make sure that we are only doing the amount of uh, verification that we need to, we reduced that from three rounds to two rounds. And we took the opportunity to use the first time slot to be able to do um, support and development work with the teachers to, and it, with the teachers who are uh, sent to us as nominees to. Um, Ex ex give them exemplification, uh, give them uh, samples of how to combine assessments so that instead of doing multiple assessments, you're able to capture the, the learning outcomes of an individual by using one assessment only. So that is what we did uh, in the period in the run-up to Christmas. So that's one of the actions that we're undertaking. And we're also, uh, we also offer to all local authorities the option to be able to uh, uh, request that we go and give them specific CPD around uh, the, the new qualifications that were introduced to try and again, as we talked earlier, um, uh, spread best practice in terms of assessment because this is a change in the way people ha are doing assessment. That it is a cultural shift from checking every single thing individually to being able to act to to capture someone's abilities in one one assessment and be able to record all of those things separately. Over assessment, uh, it's, it's interesting actually that, that was focused on because this has come up before uh, before this committee, the question of uh, excessive assessment. Uh, and it was felt that that would fall away again after the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence, after it got through its teething problems and a lot of it uh, was described as being teachers over assessing to try and do the best they could for, their, uh, for, the, for, the, for the students. Um, however, today, uh, we were told that, in fact, it was increasing. It was an increasing problem, was what I took away from the comments that were made. Whereas it, it, I would have expected it to be the other way around, particularly in view of the comments that uh, Dr Brown made today. You've heard from Dr Brown in terms of the um, proactive steps take, taken by the SQE to, to reduce um, the, the assessment and you know, the, the, the inevitable um, burden um, of that. Um, as I said in my remarks, that uh, in terms of the uh, Curriculum for Excellence uh, programme board, um, they undertook um, a, a piece of work a very reflective bit of work um, and attached to that work is a very detailed action plan uh, which requires very specific actions of the SQA, uh, you know, Government and uh, Education Scotland um, about what they can actually do uh, to ensure that we learn from the first year um, of uh, the, the new exams. And I will ask Graham to speak a bit about, it's a very important role um, of Education Scotland when they're inspecting schools, uh, you know, to look um, at that assessment issue and to look um, at how you know, needless bureaucracy can be tackled. Yeah, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, as I outlined earlier, um, you know, we've seen um, significant change uh, here in schools through the inspection programme and the support visits. In fact, all our secondary school inspections between August and Christmas were positive. Um, and inspectors have been challenging and discussing um, unnecessary bureaucracy, raising it in a, in a number of reports. The uh, national bodies have completed a number of key activities since the Re Re Reflections report was published. Um, for example, we've been signalling key documents that teachers need to look at. There's been the route maps through assessment, really practical documents which suggest which um, pieces of guidance teachers need to look at and in which order and, and that helps also to make sure that the time teachers have is spent as productively as possible. I think also at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, through our programme of bringing all the head teachers together, we're showcasing schools which have reduced assessment. We've seen progress at building in assessment through the broad general education rather than separating it out. And some of the most outstanding examples that have been showcased nationally through these events are where schools have looked at the rhythm of assessments, looked across S4 and see, looked for where the different hotspots are and made sure for young people those were planned and spread across the year as well as possible. 
We've also produced toolkits as a response to that, the report that Ms Constance mentioned, which look at streamlining the curriculum structure in primary and in S1 to 3, and showcase the best practice we've seen where planning has been reduced and the amount of paperwork teachers have been reduced significantly and the impact that has um, to release more time for supporting individual young people. It's also important, can you know, just want to um, highlight in direct response to Mr Beattie's question that the management board, uh, when it next meets, will be looking at this very issue because the management board uh, for Curriculum for Excellence will want to evaluate the impact of the work being undertaken by Education Scotland uh, and the SQA in terms of the very specific actions that they have upon their organisations to reduce bureaucracy. So this is very much an issue that we'll pay very, very close attention to. Thank you. Got a supplementary from Mark Griffin. Yeah, just a quick supplementary on workload. Uh, an issue that was raised by Larry Flanagan in the previous session was um, the workload of teachers who will be implementing a new hire and a new advanced hire qualification in, in the same year as a result of um, delaying and still using the old hire in this current year. It's, is there going to be any extra support or advice given to schools who are going to going to be implementing the new higher and advanced higher um, in the same year as a result of that? That's the point that you're making, Mr Griffin. I mean, there's been extensive support in terms of the, the new hires, um, in terms of what's already been put in place. And I suppose one example of that is that the, the SQA have organised 140 events which have involved over 7,000 teachers. And obviously, as we move forward to the next academic year, um, you know, from June onwards to, to the advanced hire, um, there's been a lot of preparation uh, done by the SQA and others um, as well. So, for example, this month there will be various materials and guidance and uh, specimen questions and papers for the advanced uh, hires uh, introduced. Uh, and uh, again, you know, the SQA will run um, a variety of events which over 4,000 teachers have signed up to. Um, so, you know, we are doing um, everything that we can to ensure that teachers are getting the right and very specific support with regards to the new hires, but also, uh, you know, the revised uh, ad advanced hires as well. Do you think the teachers who have chosen to defer and are using the old hires and will then implement new hires and new advanced hires at the same time, do you think they have um, the time um, outside their, their class time um, to be attending those seminars and, and going through that additional material to implement um, advanced hires and new hires in, in the one year? Of course, earlier uh, on, the government did uh, introduce uh, increased funding and support for more uh, continuous professional development days. And that was a very important as part of our progress as we move forward with, with the new qualifications. Um, but teachers, it's teachers that make decisions about uh, what's best for their learners um, and it varies from subject choice to subject choice. So teachers are making decisions about whether to use the new or existing hire um, and it's very important that these are professional decisions and of course teachers make these decisions um, in, in the round. Um, it's also important to recognise that the number of students who participate in advanced hires is obviously much smaller uh, than students who take uh, hires. Uh, the advanced hire is quite different in the sense that um, it's more about independent learning. Uh, the taught component um, is, is, is much smaller. Um, we, of course, you know, will always have a watch and brief and listen very carefully to the feedback that we get from stakeholders and teachers uh, in, in, in particular. Uh, but there is flexibility um, with the, the dual running of the new and existing hires for very pragmatic uh, reasons. And it would appear to me uh, that schools seem to be using that opportunity very sensibly uh, based on the needs uh, of their learners and the circumstances uh, of, of their own school. I think, um, Cabinet Secretary, um, the, the point that Mark's getting to there is that, and it came up in this morning's evidence, was that uh, uh, the flexibility provided for the introduction of the new hire was very much welcomed. Um, and, you know, approximately half have gone for the old hire and half the new hire. But the same flexibility has not been introduced for the introduction of the, of the, the new advanced hire. Um, and therefore, obviously, 
Uh, the question is, why is it, was it been allowed for that higher, but not for the advanced higher? OK. I mean, as I said in my initial remarks, convener, that, you know, there is about 22,000 uh, entries for advanced hire. It's a much smaller uh, cohort, if you like, whereas for hires, um, you're looking at, you know, over 200,000 uh, entries. Um, the course um, is quite different in terms of advanced hires. There's a less, far smaller uh, talk component. Certainly when I met with Scottish Leaders Scotland just before Christmas, they were very clear um, that there was no need to have um, a dual system uh, for the advanced hires. Uh, it's been part of the timetable. You know, we're, you know, there's a three-year timetable across the piece uh, to introduce uh, the, the, the new qualifications. Um, but, I mean, I can ask, you know, Janet Brown and, and Graham to speak a bit more ab about that. Um, but I think, you know, there's there certainly a, f a feeling, you know, that, um, you know, I haven't as yet heard a compelling case for a dual running in the advanced hires, given that the numbers are smaller and that the, the talk component uh, is much smaller as well. Janet, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, yes, I think um, the, for, the, the nature of the advanced hire is is a very deep learning. It's, it, it's at the next, next SCQF level above higher, equivalent of the first year of university. It therefore puts a lot of demands on the individual student, and, and it is something that is about them taking responsibility for their, their own learning, which is actually why universities like students to have had an advanced hire, because it actually prepares them for the, for the nature of the learning that, that they would normally do. When students have finished hires, they will often migrate into a university setting anyway, and therefore they will face a new curriculum, they will face a new challenge. So I think from a student's perspective, whether it's moving to the new hire or the existing hire, the, the new advanced hire or the existing advanced hire, um, if there were to be a new one, it would be no different because uh, they are facing that transition into a university environment anyway. From the point of view of uh, the support that we're providing, uh, one of the things we, we have recognised is that the nature of the advanced hire is not changing. We have changed the nature of uh, the hire. We've talked about uh, adding course assessments, uh, which, are, uh, which are about investigations. So we've brought some of the um, capacities and the skills development that have historically been been in the advanced hire down into the higher, so there is a bigger ch a bigger change in the in the new hire from the old hire. But in in the case of advanced hire, it's a very similar structure, uh, and the nature of the change is by no means as great. There are obviously some subject issues in terms of the nature of some subjects that are uh, that face uh, a, a bigger change in terms of the curriculum. That is why we're focusing on those subjects, and that is why we're providing support. Uh, in the events that actually started last week. So we were running advanced hire events from um, January the 26th through to April, and part of those uh, events will actually focus on what has changed from the existing advanced hire to the new advanced hire. Thank you. Liam, you, you had a, a quick supplementary. I'll bring you in later, but a supplementary on this particular issue, was it? It was. I, I've on now got another supplementary on, the, on following up your you, own you question. You can have there. one supplementary now. I'll have one no. well, It was getting back to Colin Beattie's um, point about, about workload and, and, and assessment. And I mean, it was interesting to hear um, the, the, the comments both from, from Graham and Janet about the work that's been uh, done. But, but nevertheless, that, that work has been ongoing, and, and yet the written evidence we've had. Um, from a, a number of different individual headmasters uh, and, and schools, Burham U High School, uh, George Watson's, uh, Hamilton Grammar, uh, Glenifer High School in Paisley, all have a similar theme um, around uh, assessment. Um, I, if I quote the um, head teacher for Burham U High School, one of the points he, he makes is that the same skills are being tested too frequently. And I, I think a similar point made by Head teacher George Watson saying new assessment requirements place too much emphasis on establishing basic standards rather than enabling pupils to strive for tr true excellence. So I wonder whether there's an issue for the management board that the thing that's being tested or, or assessed isn't necessarily the, the wrong thing to be testing, but actually we're perhaps going overboard in, in, in requiring that to be um, sort of proved to the nth degree rather than having an assessment that, 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 that deals with a range of different skills that, that pupils would be expected to, to develop over the course of, of, of whether it's the new hires, I suspect the same issue around national fours and fives. Yeah, and 
The Management Board has a very important role here, um, particularly in scrutinising the impact of the actions that are um, as a result of the Reflections report. So, you know, that we always have to be hyper-vigilant uh, that we're getting the right level assessment um, on uh, the, the, the right aspects. Is there something else you want to add, Janet? Yeah, I, th I think uh, one of the things that we need to make sure is that a particular outcome is not assessed multiple times. That is never... A uh, the intention that there are really good practices that we're starting to share because the, the existence proof now is there from last year's national fives and what we're sharing what we shared just before Christmas was uh, existing student work on hires that actually does uh, give examples of how you can assess an outcome once, that you don't have to keep assessing it. And actually, um, teachers using their professional judgment as to when to assess something. It, if, if you think about assessment is for learning, it's done during the course of, of teaching. If we can have that philosophy around how do we ensure that students are meeting the standard at a qualification level, then we should be able to take the assessment that kids are doing uh, during their regular work and be able to use that to be able to prove to SQA or to prove to teachers and then teachers can go and just every uh, on, a, on a sampling basis make sure that teachers are teaching to standard and that will reduce the amount of assessment. I, 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 think, I think Colin Beattie first made the point that, that we would rather hoped and assumed that the, the, the problems we saw last year would be kind of ironed out um, in due course and, and notwithstanding Graham's point about the, um, the, the, the assessments that have been done or, or, or the, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the investigations have been done um, by Education Scotland across a range of schools have, have indicated that, um, that the assessment problem is, is abating. Nevertheless, we're getting this feedback from individual schools. I would have thought a, a number of them would see themselves as, as, as kind of e exemplars, and, and yet they still seem to be identifying the issue of assessment as, as a problem, perhaps for different reasons, but nevertheless it, it's coming up, um, even at this stage, as a, 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 as a persistent problem. We, will f we do go and talk to schools. We have uh, uh, a CFE liaison team that visits all schools, and so we will follow up on all of these pieces of feedback. I think one of the, one of the, the things to, re to remember is that schools are not only doing internal assessment for National 5 this year, they're also doing internal assessment for hire. Um, and I think we need to understand how those two interplay. Can I just say I'll be asking the same two questions as I did earlier, and I've already had a response from Dr. Brown and Graham, so just to try and save some time, <laughs> unless they have anything new to add. <laughs> uh, it, it was uh, really just on the articulation from the hire to the advanced hire. Uh, in particular, we have a paper today from SPICE, and uh, for higher courses for more than 3,000 entries, if you look at uh, the percentage that chose to do the new hire, at the very bottom, 40% and under, is biology, physics and chemistry. And I appreciate it's been touched on today. Now, we have uh, a paper from St Andrews, uh, Madras College St Andrews. And to be fair, there's a thread running through our briefing papers today. Uh, but this one, I think, sums it up. We've been given to understand that in many subjects, the old hires do not articulate well with the new advanced hire. Now, that would cause concern. And I think it's just fair to comment on the parents, Scottish Parents Forum as they haven't been represented today. And they say... It's unfortunate that there's nothing currently available on the SQA website, as many parents will be looking for this now, as the prelims are underway, and will be looking for information to support their children in the exams in April. So it's really the lack of information, uh, the concern about STEM subjects, uh, and given that the, there's a lower percentage uh, for, for the STEM subjects than others, and if the paper from Madras College and others, if they're understanding that pupils doing the old hire will have greater difficulty articulating to the advanced hire, I, I would really like to, to hear what's been said to alleviate and allay these concerns. I mean, Mrs. Scanlon's uh, right to draw attention to the fact that. Um, you know, there's variance over the range of subjects. So in some subjects, 84% um, are doing uh, the, the new hires. Um, in some subjects, you know, for example, in computing science, it's, it's 30%. Um, 
Um, and that is to be expected because I think with the, the, the STEM subjects, computing science and the other sciences, these are the hires that have had the biggest change in terms of assessment and indeed uh, content. And that was one of the reasons why there was flexibility uh, allowed uh, in the first place. It is important to state, though, that whether a young person is doing uh, the existing hire or the new hire and wish to articulate and progress to advance hire, that they uh, will not be uh, disadvantaged. Um, a hire is a hire. Um, our existing hires are very good. They're gold standard uh, qualifications, highly regarded by students, parents and employers. But of course, because the world never stands still, we have to revise the <coughs> qualifications before they become um, out of date. And of course, the new hire uh, will um, have more synergies with the advanced hire and the, the, the curriculum uh, that has been taught uh, throughout the, the school. Um, but we do have to recognise that professional teachers uh, are very good at managing progression uh, you know, from one uh, course uh, to, to the other. Um, so no student should be uh, d disadvantaged. Uh, and it is very important that I suppose when we're explaining and indeed supporting teachers um, that, you know, that they're getting the right kind of continuous professional development, um, particularly for those subjects where the change um, has, has been uh, biggest. Um, and I'll ask Janet to speak about the, the, the SQA website, if that's okay. I understand it. There is greater synergy uh -huh. between the new hire and the advanced hire. Mm -hmm. What is being done to address the lesser synergy between the old hire and the advanced hire? It's just to make sure that yeah. something is in place. And by the way, I've heard from Janet on the oh, right. website already. You're quite so, happy the so unless you've got anything else to say. Um, but it's really just that gap. Uh -huh. There's a greater synergy between one and another. What about the gap between the old hire and the new advance? And, and I think maybe that's perhaps the, the way. That's that's I think that's perhaps here. the way to articulate it is that you know whether it's you know a, a new or existing hire, you know that you know the. the they, they lead appropriately uh, to uh, the, the advanced hires. Um, but these are issues for um, teachers to manage. Um, in the classroom, teachers are very um, good at that. Um, and, you know, the purpose of these many SQA events, you know, that have been organised, that, you know, thousands of teachers uh, are attending, is indeed to address the issue that uh, Mrs Scanlon raises to ensure that we get the right level of support to teachers who can then in turn give the right level of support to students. Perhaps you could have a look at the website and make up your own mind about okay. whether or not. Right, I'll my, do that. my second. Uh, oh, sorry, just okay. Jan, we have heard about the website. No, but can I just say Wait, that specifically, just during January and February, the, uh, the similarities and differences between the existing advanced hire and the new advanced hire will be published on the website. They are not there now, that, that some of them are up already and they will be completed by the end of February. I think we can understand why parents would want them for prelims as well as finals, but uh, we'll move on from there. Uh, the next one was uh, last week we heard evidence from the Learned Societies group, and I appreciate what Larry Flanagan said, that a lot of it applied UK-wide, but nonetheless uh, there were applications to Scotland. So it's back to the, the, the STEM subjects again. Um, we've heard about uh, significantly about the shortage of teachers for STEM subjects. Uh, Colin Beattie and I were in Inverness yesterday and we were hearing about uh, uh, pupils from the Highlands not being able to get into Scottish medical schools. I don't know how much of that is them not being able to do some of the sciences, but uh, probably the main concern came up last night where Murray Council had to close schools, including Elgin High School, uh, because there's no teachers. I've never heard that in my lifetime. And I just wonder, is this, uh, does this just apply to Murray? Is this an issue that you know about? Uh, we had a conversation about, I think it was Larry Flanagan, that said there's no problem recruiting to teacher training, but it seems to be retaining these students in the teaching profession. But I just wonder overall if the scenario is something you're aware about and what the government is doing to address the issues, because I don't think any local authority wants to close schools. 
Indeed, and neither would any parent, um, you know, want to um, be faced with with that experience either. I suppose there's a, a number of issues here, if, if you bear with me, um, convener. Um, I am indeed certainly aware that in parts of Scotland uh, there are shortages of teachers in specific uh, subjects. It is indeed more likely to be um, in STEM subjects and in rural parts of Scotland, although there are issues um, in places like uh, Aberdeen um, as, as, as well. Uh, teacher unemployment is very, very low in Scotland. It's the lowest uh, in, in, in the UK. Um, and while it has to be recognised that uh, local authorities are the employers of teachers, and they do have a number of uh, options uh, open to them, um, you know, within the context of the parameters of national pay bargaining. But they can offer, um, you know, some financial inducements to, um, you know, to, to, to recruit and to help people to relocate uh, to other areas in, in Scotland as well. And indeed, I heard someone from Murray Council on the radio yesterday uh, talk about um, how they are trying to promote Murray as a good place to live, which uh, I'm sure it is. Um, and how they help with relocation expenses um, and some authorities do have fi financial um, in inducements as well. She also, the, the lady from Murray Council, spoke um, very effectively, and I know other councils uh, try and do this as well, is that in terms of their non-teaching staff, whether it's classroom assistants who would wish uh, to go on uh, and teach, uh, they find that a very effective way um, of you know, people already uh, who've you know, invested in their life uh, in a particular area for them to go on and study to become uh, a teacher is quite an, an effective way um, of um, dealing with uh, shortages. Um, from my perspective, and I appreciate Mrs Scarman, this doesn't necessarily help with, with the here and now, um, but just um, at the turn of the year there, I made uh, an announcement that we were increasing the number of teachers going into initial teaching uh, education, both at primary school and indeed at secondary school. And it is something that we uh, will have to um, become more finessed at in terms of the numbers uh, entering uh, into teacher education. Uh, but thinking more about how we, in doing so, help with uh, shortages of teachers in particular uh, rural locations and for particular subjects and that's a very active discussion that we're having uh, with universities and the uh, universities of highlands and islands about how we move forward with that agenda thank you thank you thank you you just spoke about the teacher numbers and teacher training and, and obviously the welcome announcement that you did make at the turn of the year we had an evidence this morning though that what was maybe needed is a tracking system for those probationary teachers to see where they go after um, they get their education because um i think it was larry flanagan had said that the teachers may and as is the right go abroad or, or might not necessarily go into teaching um, and so we're investing a lot of money into that but not getting the teachers uh, are you coming up with a tracking system is that something that the government are looking at at the minute I mean, I haven't had that specific uh, suggestion made uh, directly to, to myself, Ms McMahon. Um, I suppose there are always issues across the, the, the public sector where people, you know, choose to go to sunnier climes or, you know, uh, move elsewhere um, in, in, in the UK. Um, you know, teaching in Scotland, Scotland's a good place to teach. We invest heavily in the, the, the teaching uh, workforce. Um, we have very low teacher unemployment compared to elsewhere in the UK. The difference in the figures is quite stark. I mean, the last figures I've seen is that there are 40 teachers uh, right across Scotland, uh, you know, claiming job seekers uh, allowance. That is like less than 1% of, you know, the, the, the overall workforce, very low uh, teacher unemployment, although that raises challenges for when there is a, a shortage uh, of teachers in particular parts of the country and particular uh, subjects. Um, you know, if there is evidence that you know we are training teachers and that they are not um, you know continuing uh, with that their the chosen vacation you know we'll always you know uh, uh, look at that but I would be looking for some you know kind of substantial uh, evidence it's 
good good place to teach us in Scotland. Is there anything you want to add to that, Graham? Yeah, just to say, obviously, the the fact that our teachers have that guaranteed year when they come out of their infrastructure education has been recognised by the OECD as a world leading entitlement. So we're off to that strong start, and we of course do um, through workforce planning and modelling um, look at numbers. Um, I'm certainly not aware of substantial numbers exiting Scotland at the end of that uh, first year, but it is something, of course, we can look into further. That information you can give to the committee would be grateful. Yeah. Um, uh, Chick Brody and then Mark. Just one question. Uh, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we heard from Dr Janet Brown in the previous session um, that in any programme like this, the first year is always difficult and the second year will be better. ADES uh, said in their submission that in conclusion it would advise the Education Committee that CFE continues to develop and mature in a manner that supports the needs of children and young people. Now changes are constant and that's what we're you know, uh, going through. Um, and despite that we seem to get some excited commentary, some of it justified this morning when we talked of a communication with local authorities. But we had some agitation last week about the appeal system. Can you just uh, confirm uh, for, for us and the wider uh, audience that no pupil, no pupil is at a disadvantage regardless of whether they went to a state or private school? And as Ken Cunningham, the General Secretary of the School Leader of Scotland said, described the, the issue as a bit of a red herring. Well, thanks for that, Mr. Brody. I mean, I, I would concur uh, with that view. Um, it's important to recognise that we moved away from the old appeals system, um, having consulted heavily about it. And there was a great deal of consensus about the need to change from the old appeals system. Um, the old appeals system, um, there was concerns that it was overused, that children who were absent from their exams due to a bereavement or an illness, there was some concerns that they were disadvantaged uh, in comparison to the children who uh, the feeling was they'd not done as well on their exam uh, as they could have uh, on the day. There was concerns about how the old appeal system was impacting uh, on uh, learning teaching um, because a lot of time was spent gathering evidence in anticipation uh, of an appeal when an appeal system was meant to be dealing with the, the, the exceptional uh, cases. So we move forward to a new system and I suppose it's important to say that you know that that's in uh, two parts there's the um, pre-results part of the system um, should a child um, in exceptional and you know quite often tragic circumstances not be able to sit their exam due to illness or indeed a bereavement that um, the teachers that the school can submit alternative evidence and that those children, like everybody else, will get their exam results on the same, same day and they're not uh, disadvantaged. That, of course, is the post-results um, service, um, which is new and which was subject to uh, much uh, commentary uh, last uh, week. Um, I would agree, I think... Um, some of the commentary uh, was uh, disin disingenuous um, and would like to make clear uh, to committee that the people who make a decision about whether to contact the SQA and whether to pursue uh, an appeal is indeed teachers. Um, and that is a professional decision uh, made by uh, teachers. Um, and indeed, the SQA only accept um, you know, appeals from, from teachers, uh, from, from schools uh, and, and, and colleges. Uh, they don't accept uh, appeals from uh, individuals. Siobhan. Just a follow-up on the, the post results service. Um, we've got a, a brief one from Spice here that show the statistics um, from the old system until the new system, and so I'll just read out and then ask for comment, really. So the statistics show that 1.6% of eligible entries requested a results uh, service review. Of these, 25.7% resulted in a grade change, and those didn't include the exceptional circumstances, as the Cabinet Secretary just, just spoke of. In comparison, in 2013, 
5% of standard grade results were appealed, as were 11% of hires and advanced hires. 43% of appeals at standard grade were successful, as were 43% of higher appeals and 48% of advanced hire. Are you concerned about the disparity in those figures? No, oh, I'm not actually, Ms McMahon, because I think those figures demonstrate the case for changing to um, a new system. Um, you know, having a, a system where you know there were so many appeals, uh, of course, uh, raises uh, questions, uh, and the fact that the number of appeals uh, has, has fallen, um, I think, is to be expected and um, is positive, and I think. The new system, um, you know, appeals are being made um, where, you know, you would th there would be a higher expectation of uh, that that appeal being uh, su successful. So I, I can't say I am surprised by, by those figures, convener. I heard again just in the follow up to that in Facebook comments to the committee um, from those who, who are, are sitting um, the hires. And there seems to be a bit of confusion about the appeals process to begin with, because I will read this sentence, but I know that the appeals process isn't abolished, so I'm not suggesting for one minute it has been abolished. However, it says, by abolishing the appeal procedure, young people are now pressurised into performing their best during one exam after a 12-month long course. So the expectation there is for the pupil not only to be under pressure throughout the year with continuous assessment, but having to perform to their very best at exam level. And, and we all know things can go wrong. I, I was one of those who went through the higher still and higher phase. Um, so I understand some of that pressure, um, if not all. So we all understand things can go wrong. But that, I suppose, be it misinformation, be it um, something that is out there, pupils do not feel that they will get an appeal, particularly if they are in a state school. Do you not think that's concerning? Uh, will have access to the, the post results service uh, if they're in uh, a, a state school um, and I think in that regard we can certainly rely on the professionalism um, of our, our teaching staff to, to deliver that. I think the interesting point that, that you make about pressure in young people is we should think about you know one of the reasons why we have curriculum for excellence and one of the reasons why we have um, change to, to new exams is that while we haven't eradicated exams, um, because of course there's part of um, that's experience of life, you know, um, coping with under pressure, you know, to deadlines, you know, on a particular date, but the balance is different and that's why, you know, you have uh, various units which are uh, assessed as well. So, you know, whether someone gets their qualification, you know, it, you know the exam isn't um, you know, the, the be-all and the, the, the end-all um, of that qualification. Um, you know, for example, typically uh, with a hire, you've got uh, three um, units th uh, uh, that are assessed and then there's the, the external assessment, which typically, you know, is, you know, an assignment and, and an exam paper. Um, so the balance between assessment and exams and the new qualifications is different. Uh, so it shouldn't all be be about pressure on young people at an exam, although, you know, I have to um, acknowledge that, you know, as exams still exist, there will indeed be, you know, an element of pressure for, for young people, and it is important that young people are, are supported through that. Is there anything you wish to, to add, Janet? Yeah, I, I, I would reinforce the uh, the point about the balance between internal and external assessment. As you can see, moving through National 1 through National 5 to higher and advanced higher, an examination is um, introduced at National 5. There is no examination at National 4. And the nature of the examination is to allow uh, a candidate to be able to demonstrate that they can perform it on a day. Uh, that is what they're going to be expected to do when they go into the university sector or where they go on to their next, um, their next challenge. So the, the, the examination component is a smaller component than it has been historically in the old hire, um, but is a significant component in terms of the fact that it, it allows the demonstration of the ability to perform on the day in, in an exam situation. But we have that balanced against the internal assessment that's undertaken through throughout the school system. Uh, in terms of the, 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 the point you made about the appeal system is no longer there, we have a post results services system now. The old appeal system... Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I, I said it was 
was, wasn't there? I said it was. It was a quote. It's yes. a miscommunication. No, of, but so that, I didn't say it. No, no, no. But I'm. I'm. I, <laughs> I actually want to sort of make sure that everyone understands the old appeal system has gone. Uh, in those day, in, in in the previous system, the schools were uh, undertaking multiple assessments to be able to prepare just in case the candidate didn't quite make the grade that they thought they were going to make, and then they would send us. Uh, information and material that was pre prescribed by us because it had to meet the standard. That is why so many candidates were um, applying for appeals. What we have now is going back to the original philosophy of why the appeal system was introduced in the first place a long time ago. And that's for those children, as the Cabinet <laughs> Secretary have, has, has indicated, that are in really dire circumstances and cannot sit the examination. Under the circumstances of exceptional uh, case that is, that is demonstrated by the school, we are able to look at a variety of different, examina uh, uh, of different uh, evidence that allows us not to just look at prelim, but to look at the coursework, to look at how that individual child has done and be able to give them the exact grade that they deserve. And that is something that is different in this case. So we have exceptional circumstances for those cases, such as um, a, a death in the family or a severe illness. But we also have post-result services that allow for uh, a check. If a teacher thinks that this candidate really should have done significantly better than they have done. We can then go and look and see what has happened within the uh, external examination component that they've undertaken. So it is a very different system now than it was in the past. I understand that, Dr Brown. You've explained that to the committee. We'll understand that. But do you accept that there is, at best, miscommunication going on here? Um, if there's confusion about the appeals process, now, as I said, you've explained it to me. I understand it completely. But even if it's it's not impacting on the stats, as, as the Cabinet Secretary believed to be the case um, th and thinks it's a more robust system, there's still this confusion given the comments that we have received in evidence um, to the committee. We always have to strive to do more, particularly in a, a period of change, to communicate uh, better, in particular with parents and young people. OK, thanks. Okay. Mark. couple of questions on the the number of people a uh, number of pupils who have uh, chosen to stick with the the old tires um, this year uh, the Scottish government was previously of the opinion um, I quote the education minister that a small minority of pupils um, would sit would choose to sit the whole tire um, can I just ask a uh, cabinet secretary for your comments on the number of people who have chosen to sit the old tire and um, perhaps comment on why the Scottish Government's view was previously that only a small minority of pupils would choose to do so. Okay, thank you. The first thing I'd like to say, Mr Griffin, is it's not pupils who in isolation choose which higher they're doing. Um, that is a decision that teachers, that the, the professionals in the classroom take. Uh, of course, you know, we would be expecting them to do in consultation um, you know, with the, the pupils uh, and uh, parents as well. But it's important to emphasise that it's teachers that make decisions and schools that make decisions about uh, whether it's the new or the existing higher in any subject uh, that is being pursued uh, for this year. Um, in terms of you know, coming to this with a fresh pair of eyes, um, if you like, the fact that we have um, agreed to a dual system, um, it doesn't surprise me that um, a significant amount of people for this year um, are continuing with the, the existing hire. Um, I'm pleased that you know, the overall figure is 55% um, of uh, uh, students will be doing uh, the, the, the new hire. Um, I think that's to be welcomed. There are, of course, significant variances from subject to subject, but again, that's to be expected and, you know, I think demonstrates how important it is to be given teachers uh, the flexibility to be exercising their professional judgment. And that's a hallmark of curriculum for excellence that we trust our professionally trained teachers uh, who operate in the front line in the classroom to, to be making these decisions. Okay, thanks. We heard earlier from um, Jane Peckham of the National Association of Schoolmasters Union of Women's Teachers, and she um, 
had welcomed the flexibility that, that was given, but questioned whether um, all teaching professionals were actually given that flexibility and the ability um, to choose what was best they thought for their pupils. Are you confident that um, all schools, all head teachers, um, gave their teachers the, the flexibility to choose um, whether their pupils were in the right place to move on to the new hires or were given the choice to stick to the existing hire? It's um, difficult for me to speak conclusively on behalf of local government who, you know, at the end of the day, um, employ teachers and head teachers. From my experience of the schools that I've visited, uh, and particular just last week when I went to Craig Royston uh, High School in Edinburgh, um, I met with uh, a number of uh, principal teachers um, and also the, the head teacher. And the principal teachers in their discussions with me um, were given a very clear account of the decisions that they'd made and why. Um, whereas, you know, for one example would be the, the principal teacher for you know drama and the arts uh, and the various subjects in her faculty uh, they were largely going uh, to, to the new hire the English principal teacher uh, was talking about how uh, they had moved to the new hire and the, the computer science teacher uh, who in his faculty um, you know had computer science you know business administration um, and you know other subjects you know spoke about how uh, he had decided um, that there was taken advantage of the, the dual system given you know the changes in the, the computer science hire and he spoke favorably of the support available to him and the support materials and how the extra time uh, was beneficial to acquaint himself uh, with that uh, information and uh, you know the, the, the new content and it made sense uh, for him to to do the introduction uh, o o over two years so from my experience i can see evidence of teachers uh, making those decisions okay. george adam yeah, actually uh, mr griffin brings up an important point that was brought up uh, by Mr Flanagan as well. He said that a lot of local authorities when it came to the hires, uh, in theory, actually supported the idea of the schools, uh, devolving the decision to the schools. Uh, he also said that, uh, then he went on to say, contradict himself by saying a majority uh, ended up doing it uh, that way as well. But uh, the whole idea is, it brings to a big question as well, that he also mentioned, Larry Flanagan, that national policy, delivering it at a local level, can be quite difficult from the point of view that uh, there's a lot of local authorities doing great work and there's some local authorities uh, creating a bureaucracy to look at bu bureaucracy. So uh, is there any way that we could possibly... One of the things that came up during our budget uh, details was that parents groups were saying a very important way how we deliver education in Scotland in the future and they were looking at various other things. No one's talking about redesigning local authorities, but is there not a better way for local authorities to work together with best practice to ensure that across the board that everyone's actually getting uh, the, the best that they can possibly get? I mean, the reality in terms of the, the here and now convener is that we, we have 32 local authorities um, and there is a, a, a variance of practice and implementation um, of uh, the new hires. Um, you know, in some areas we can see that that subject by subject uh, choice and as I demonstrated with uh, Craig Royston uh, High Schools, you know, different decisions taken in different subjects, uh, rightly so. Um, you know, some schools will do things more collectively collectively as uh, a school um, and then some local authorities you know will have um, you know more, more of a, a blanket approach uh, than others um, in my uh, very recent meetings with the uh, ADES that's the Association of Directors of Education uh, of, of Scotland um, they have produced a bit of work which talks about their 2020 vision um, of education uh, and as part of that uh, they are talking about a, a national performance uh, framework, they have different ideas within their membership uh, about how that could be taken forward uh, and, and pursued uh, but it is an idea that I'm certainly very interested in as a national performance uh, framework where we have very clear uh, you know, national uh, positions uh, but of course you know, there always has to be uh, local flexibility. Lee MacArthur. Thank you. Can I come back to a point uh, both yourself and Mark Griffin were making in relation to the uh, to the new hires? Um, 
I mean, I think one of the, the characteristics of the rollout of National 4 and 5s was that as a committee, we found ourselves re returning to the issue and the, your predecessor, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, was at pains to point out that when a request was made to him, he, he responded, whether with additional resources or, or, or deep audits or whatever. But it felt as if we were constantly chasing a problem over the horizon. And now, I think quite sensibly the approach was taken in relation to the new hires to allow the, the, the flexibility course by course, school by school. And, and I think while you express no surprise at the numbers who have sought to stick with the existing hires rather than move to the new hires, it clearly was a surprise to, um, to, to, to Mr Russell and indeed to, to Dr Allen, given what they were on record as, as, as saying is their anticipation of the numbers involved. But given where, where we are, um, I, and the principle, the principle having been accepted, I, I cannot understand why you wouldn't want to roll that principle forward in relation to the advanced hires. Uh, even if um, your predictions are borne out and the numbers who, who uh, stick to the, the current advanced hires are fairly minimal uh, in a cohort that it itself is smaller. Nevertheless, for those uh, to whom that applies, presumably the, the decision has been taken by teachers, by schools, that that's the appropriate advanced hire for them uh, to do. And, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand having accepted the principle, itself a reflection of, I think, lessons learned in terms of the relation, um, the, 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 the response to the rollout in National 4 or 5s, why there's a reversion back to a situation which could very well see us doing the same as we did last year, which is chasing a problem uh, over the horizon, not across the board, but, but on particular subjects and in particular schools. And, and I think, Janet, your point about um, this reflecting more of the jump from um, school to university learning it, it is, is fair from a, perhaps a pupil perspective, but you're dealing with then lecturers and tutors who are comfortable with curriculum and not trying to um, uh, put in place something that is, is new to them as well as the, the pupils. Um, and it's some of that kind of uncertainty among staff that has had a knock-on impact on the pupils. And, and again, I think reinforces um, the sense that we're, we're, we're trying to kind of accelerate it again at a point where um, it seems to be accepted that providing a bit more flexibility is in, is in everybody's interest in making sure that this is implemented successfully and smoothly for, for everybody. The, the, the history of uh, curriculum for excellence, and uh, as I said earlier, I you know I have had a chance to look at things with a, a fresh pair of eyes, um, in, in some instances, um, and you know I, I think the point you make about um, you know perhaps implementation group and the management go board, you know now is a good time for us to be doing a bit more horizon planning and for us not to be feeling that we're constantly revisiting uh, the same issues um, and you know what is coming across globally i mean not everybody agrees in every uh, point or every view but certainly my overall impression from you know whether it's ADES or the, the teaching unions is that things are certainly less pressured this year than they were uh, last year um, and i don't i don't want to you know reiterate completely convener you know what's been said you know earlier um, but i mean janet brown did, did speak um, in detail that in terms of the advanced hires you know from the, the to the new advanced hires you know there will be less change it is a you know smaller cohort of pupils um you know it is a a, a course that has a, a smaller um talk component um and you know i haven't heard you know an overwhelming case you know put to me that suggests that we need uh, a dual running of ad advanced tires we're not complacent you know but we're always going to you know uh, listen very carefully because in essence you know how Curriculum for Excellence has moved forward and progressed has been in partnership and in discussion uh, and in uh, consultation um, over, you know, well over um, a decade. And we're now at the point where we've got a three-year timetable for the qualifications. And I think, you know, it's a very important milestone. Um, and it's not, a, you know, I think, do you think we need to get the job done? And I'm not close to, you know, never close my ears uh, to suggestions or people who are highlighting problems, but I've not heard an overwhelming case for the dual running of the advanced tyres. 
I think some of what you said sounds entirely reasonable in terms of the numbers, in terms of the differences, but, but actually it sounds very similar to the, the case that Mike Russell was making in relation to the shift from, from national four or fives and then to, to, to new hires and his anticipation that the numbers that would stick with the old hires uh, would, be, would be, I think Mark Griffin was suggesting, a minority, a small minority. Uh, in the event, what we've seen is 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 a larger number, almost um, almost fifty percent, who stuck with uh, with the old hires, and and you may well be right as as you reduce the cohort, the type of learning changes. It may very well be that you are right, and and it would be a very small minority. But for that small minority, presumably being able to dual run for another year means that. They feel less like a guinea pig in the process that they've got a they've they've had a, a, a fair crack at the suite of qualifications that their abilities um, uh, entitled them to to expect, without necessarily derailing a process that by everybody's admission was going to take three years um, to, 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 to implement through the, through the senior phase. So, I, I mean, I, I think it would be a helpful steer, would it not, for um, teachers themselves, but, but also pupils and parents, um, to, to hear the Scottish Government say, look, we are, we are open to looking at a possible dual running. Um, rather than get into the situation we were in with the role at National 4 and 5, where, as I say, it, it seemed like it was constantly a response to crises that were, 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 were kind of um, bursting out here, there and pretty much everywhere. It was, you know, it wasn't a surprise to anybody that there was the, the dual uh, system for, attack, for um, the hires, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the nationals, um, there was, you know, the, the intermediates, you know, have, have, have ran alongside those. Um, and I think, you know, I think moving into the, the last year for, for, for intermediate two, you know, I suppose it's never been part of the plan to uh, dual run advanced hires. And I'm just, you know, we have to be cautious that at this you know, late stage that we don't have any um, unintended consequences of now saying, well, you know, we'll have uh, a dual running of advanced tyres because that in itself could be quite uh, disruptive to, you know, the planning process that, that's taking place in various parts of the education system. But before I ask Janet to speak more about, you know, the, the potential disruption of, you know, changing course now, I will ask Graeme to say a bit more about, about, about the support. Yeah, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think another point just worth bearing in mind, remember, is that the, the last cohort of pre-CFE learners will exit the system this June. So in other words, the current six years, a benefit of dual running for them was they were taught before the, the CFE um, programme in terms of the rollout there. So they will have exited the system, the six, current six year, and therefore all the children in the system uh, will have come through the CFE um, qualifications suite. So that's an advantage. I, I, I apologise, but... Is that correct? Because there are, there, I mean, East Renfrewshire Local Authority is uh, carried on with the old system. They, uh, every school in, in East Renfrewshire is doing the old system and did not take up. Then they delayed for a full year, and maybe there'll be others. But I, I don't understand why you're saying the sixth year are now are leaving the system, and therefore that's the last cohort. Because clearly the fifth years in East Renfrewshire are still doing the old system. I mean, obviously, there is that, that, that one distinction which we can talk more about, the tailored support. So let me clarify that in terms of nationally, um, the kind of last cohort. But, yeah, sorry if that was confusing. But we're certainly, with East Renfrewshire, um, engaged in supporting them and, and looking at um, any additional ways that we can work with them to look at progression from um, higher, existing hire to um, a new advanced hire. And also, I think, the support materials that we are publishing from teachers for other teachers are all coming into the system, which look at the content. As Janet was saying, there's less changes in advanced higher content. And, of course, um, the nature of that study um, is, is much more independent um, as well. I'd just also like to say that Education Scotland, we visited... Um, a individual secondary schools to provide tailored support. So we've been in 174 um, of the 370 um, up, up until Christmas there. And I'd just like to reiterate any individual department who feels they have specific support issues, again, we're keen to offer any further tailored support um, that individual teachers have in their particular departments around the uh, further implementation of curriculum for excellence. That certainly has been um, a success of the programme, that tailored support and that discussion and that offer uh, continues to be there. I think that's... It'll have to be very short. Yeah, I mean, just, 
back to the point on the post results service, and I, I, I heard what you were you were saying in response to to to, to Siobhan and to to, to check. Um, I, I think one of the concerns that came through from some of the pupils in, in the feedback was that um, with a two-year hire, there is every likelihood that some pupils will find themselves um, taking the new hire as the, the first kind of formal serious exam that they that they take um, and that uh, with all the stresses and pressures around that even <coughs> with, with, with prelims having been taken is there additional support that, that's been put in um, to ensure that the pupils that are um, being encouraged to follow that path don't find that they end up um, taking the new hire as their first formal exam, hitting the buffers and, and, and finding that, they, that they're not in the place that they really felt they should have been by that stage in their in their school school career. Do you speak to that? I, I think that that touches on the whole issue of, of teacher judgment. A teacher will be um, very aware that that student should be absolutely ready for the hire when they sit it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, that, that teachers are doing very well. They're really selecting those students that are going through the two-year hire, not taking the National Five. And, and they, they, are, they are really making sure that the, 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 t the candidate is absolutely ready, not only to only undertake the internal assessment, but also to be able to deal with the, uh, the on-the-day performance. And I think there are ways that teachers do that. I'm not sure if Graham wants to answer that from the point of view curriculum design. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, there's more variety in assessment methods now than there's ever been. You know, young people are assessed in lots of different ways throughout the broad general education. And there are still tests. You know, teachers choose when it's appropriate um, to, to, to test out um, children's progress and their skills. So I think it is all about the design of the curriculum. And we see some really good support um, in secondary schools to prepare young people for exam conditions and through study support courses and so on um, as well. Um, so that it doesn't come as a surprise for them, the sort of conditions are under um, uh, in an examination. OK, uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we really appreciate you coming along this morning uh, to assist with our discussions and examination of the new hire system under CFE. Um, I'm going to suspend the meeting for about 30 seconds just to allow the uh, witnesses to leave the table. On to item three. Our next item is to consider the Children, Performances and Activities Scotland Regulations 2014. That's SSI 2015-372. Uh, do members have any comments on this instrument? Um, before members uh, make any comment, I want to make one myself because we did, if you remember rightly, um, make some comment uh, to the uh, Minister for Children and Young People and her officials recently on two instruments uh, on the subject of consultation, one which had no consultation on it and one which had consultation but no explanation as to what had happened as a result of that consultation. Um, I'm afraid to say that uh, this current instrument, although I have no problem with it in particular, yet again has says that a public consultation on the proposals took place but doesn't tell us what the outcome of the, that consultation was nor what was changed as a result of the consultation. And we did get a promise from the um, officials and the minister that lessons had been learned or would be learned and it would be changed. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, it doesn't seem to have happened. Um, I just throw that in there because effectively um, that was something that both myself and other members of this committee questioned the minister and officials on when they came before us. So do members have any comments? 
Mary. Yeah, I don't think the Minister has uh, passed the test on this occasion and uh, I think could do better. And I think particularly as it has been raised by yourself as the convener, uh, I personally would have hoped that it would be corrected and we would be seeing something quite different in front of us today. So just to say that I support the comments you've made. I, I should say to uh, members that uh, the clerks approached the government for a response on, on knowing full well that we had raised it before. Um, and our, our response by email was forthcoming, explaining what had happened to the consultation, what the responses were and what changes had been made. Now, given that that was available um, and was given to the clerks, that, I think, makes it worse because it should have been there, given the promise that was made to this committee. Uh, any other comments? Can I make a suggestion, then, that um, um, these things may be small, but they do, uh, I think, matter, um, that we write to the Minister uh, and point out the fact that, uh, uh, given the promises that we received, um, it is disappointing that uh, uh, another um, uh, piece of supply has come forward with the same point about the consultation and the lack of information that is contained within it. Do members agree to that? Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 No, it's just right. We are just right to the Minister making the point, on the general yeah. point about yeah, yeah. consultation no, on, that. on regulations. Sorry, uh, Gordon. Especially the information was available. Yes, <laughs> I think but that's the relevant point, yeah. effectively, which makes it more irritating, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Just check on that point. Uh, one of the things that really annoyed me on Plazon, the, the sub or whatever it's called now, committee, um, this, this business of timelining things, and as a consequence, sometimes they were you know, not meeting the timelines in terms of you know, things, 40 day uh, period here, and I'm sure this is not the first time this happened. Well, so I think it's right to write to the minister, but yeah, somebody somewhere else needs to get their act together. Right. And I think that we're, making, we're not making—I'm not making a point about this particular instrument. I'm making a general point that uh, we, had, we raised before um, hasn't been addressed in this instrument, and I'm asking the committee's permission to write to the minister on that basis. Mm -hmm. We agreed with that. Can I then ask: Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instrument? It's also agreed. Thank you. Uh, our next item, our final item, is to appoint a European reporter um, following Claire Adamson's re resignation from the committee and to co consider the committee's EU priorities. Uh, can I first invite nominations for an EU reporter? <laughs> uh, thank you. Chick Brody has uh, nominated Siobhan McMahon. I know. And seconded by Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much for that. That's necessary. Are you well, I'll ask, are there any other nominations? <laughs> There are no other nominations. Siobhan, are you happy to accept? I freely accept. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll make sure that's on the record that you freely accept. <laughs> I freely accept, yes. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, does the committee agree that Siobhan McMahon be appointed as our EU reporter? Agreed. Uh, the next thing we must do is consider a response to the European External Relations Committee relating to our EU priorities. Our proposed response was included with our papers. Do members have any questions about the EU paper? No questions. Is the committee content to agree to the response that we send that to the European and External Relations Committee? Agreed. That's agreed. Uh, thank you very much for attendance. That's a relatively long meeting this, this morning, um, and I close the meeting. <laughs>